Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a very special Wednesday edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report. This is a live broadcast. Today is Wednesday, November 12, 2014. I'm Doug Hagman in studio with my son, co-host, fellow investigator, Joe Hagman. Together, we are the Hagman and Hagman Report. Folks, you're in for an incredible three-hour program. Our guests tonight are the presenters, the operators, the uh, founders, the uh, architects, if you will, of the upcoming Prophecy Forum conference. This is going to be, take place in Dublin, Ohio, and of course, um, you, you can go to HagmanandHagman.com. By the way, that HagmanandHagman.com is our base on the internet. That's our home base on the internet. Go there and look on the left-hand side. Click on the link. It'll take you directly to the information for the upcoming conference. Folks, we're going to be there. We hope to see you there as well. I just want to welcome listeners, people checking in during the day. The, the emails come in, uh, begin coming in early on, and uh, I want to say hello to listeners in uh, new listeners in Saskatchewan. I, I'm wondering what kind of weather they're having there. Uh, also in Vancouver, British Columbia, as well as Ottawa. Ottawa, uh, a lot of Canadians tonight. We also have people checking in throughout the United States, as well as Latin America and Europe. Welcome to tonight's broadcast. And of course, folks, we broadcast live each every weeknight from 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern time, with the exception of Friday. Friday, we are going to be altering our broadcast time. We're going to be broadcasting from 7.30 to 9.30 live from the Prophecy Conference in Dublin, Ireland. Oh, no, not Ireland, Ohio. I was going to just tease them and say we should go to Ireland for uh, the conference. But having said that, uh, Joe, welcome to the studio this evening. It's been a pretty full day uh, here at the office. Yes, it uh, has. And uh, hearing voices in my head, and uh, why is that? Let's see. Are you getting an echo? Uh, I'm hearing an no, echo. I, I, yeah, I've got to, I think I've got to kill some... Uh, Audio here. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we're we're blessed tonight to have with us right now on the phone uh, as our guests, two people, uh, folks. You're going to want to listen very carefully to what they've got to say. Two very special people. First, let me introduce. Okay, thank you. Um, let me introduce John Price. Folks, as you know, John wrote a fantastic book called The End of America. Uh, he's on with us. He's an excellent author, a very, very what a prolific author. Um, and I would urge... He's anyway, been a guest yeah, he has. previously on our show a few times. And, and if, folks, if you haven't gotten the book at the end of America, you ever read the book, you've got to get it, you got to read it. It's just, it's a fantastic book. By the way, before I go any further, I want to mention that tonight, that tonight's, <laughs> the reason I'm laughing, folks, in this studio, we've got, we, we've got these, these chairs that um, have an up and down feature. You know how when you um, uh, hit your, you, you can actually reach down and pull a lever and lift the, raise the uh, seat up, or alternatively, pull the lever and the seat kind of pneumatically goes down into the floor. Well, now my chin is resting on, on my desk here, um, and I'm, I'm actually having to, to uh, my foot hit the, hit the, um, Switch, but anyway, I want to remind people. See if you're in, folks. If if you go to the conference, if you're going to be there and, and you, you go to our live broadcast, you folks are going to be in for a real riot. It's going to be a, a comedy show, I'm sure. I want to remind everyone that tonight's broadcast is in fact sponsored by Harrys.com. That's Harrys.com. If you have not gone to their website, have not seen their shaving products. Uh, go to harrys.com, go to hagmanandhagman.com, click on the link, it'll take you over to harrys.com. It's a fantastic new shaving experience. It has revolutionized, really, the way we we shave. So that's harrys.com bringing you the show tonight. Joe, I'm going to say welcome to the program. Let's let's get this program rolling as you're watching people right. come in. And I've got, to, I've got to actually put some phone books out underneath me here. Go ahead. Mr. Uh, Mr. Woodward, are you with us? No. Okay. We have uh, John Price with us at the moment. We have Ray Gano at the moment. When we were waiting, uh, Mr. Doug Krieger, he was on with us last Friday. He will be on any moment. And um, gentlemen, welcome to the program. 
Great to be with Great you. Again. Yeah. Good here to be, yeah. Good here. Super. All right. So, so sorry about all of that. Uh, you know, it's, it sounded a little bit a little bit rushed there. Well, that's just sometimes how things happen. But we're we're really pleased to have you folks on. Um, I think this is the most we've had on um, one yeah. most people we've had on one show at a time. Yeah, and we've got different lights blinking and shining for different people and trying to figure out who's <laughs> who. And then, so anyway. Uh, gentlemen, among the among those present, who wants to, uh, Mr. Gano, uh, you're with Prophecy uh, or the uh, right. Prophecy Magazine, correct? Um, tell, right. Why don't you tell us, if you, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, sure. That would, that would be a good I, way to start. I, uh, yeah, I started out in the Bible prophecy arena back in 1991, and was one of the few Bible prophecy websites that uh, was on the Internet, and we'd been around for quite a long time. Uh, interestingly enough, I, I, the Lord called me out of the ministry, and uh, it got the business got sold, or the ministry got sold to somebody who then got sold to somebody who then got sold to somebody, and then someone just took pick it up. And then out of the blue, the ministry got dropped back into my lap, and it's come full circle. And uh, so back in 2005, I took Propazine back over again and we've been running it and just walking in faith and this is what I do for a living I report on the news I I write a 30 to 40 page newsletter every Monday uh, we have great people who submit articles to me all the time John Price being one of them um, but I, I love what I do I'm a watchman on the wall and uh, it's exciting to to see Bible prophecy and just the Bible as a whole come come just basically opened up right before our eyes right now. I wouldn't be I wouldn't choose to live any other time except right now. We are living in the last days of the last days and it is exciting. A lot of people get bummed out and, you know, oh woe is me or the sky is falling and everything. And yeah, I talk a lot about a, you know, about a bunch of stuff that is not too pleasant. But in the end I love talking about it because what it does is it shows that, yes, the Bible is true. And if the Bible is true, then Jesus Christ is true. And if Jesus Christ is true, then that means there's a heaven. But it also means that there's a hell and that people need to make an, a, a decision of where they're going to spend eternity. So that's what I do. Um, I'm really big into survival and preparedness. Um, I wrote a book called uh, Survive the Coming Storm. And, in fact, it's a series now because I just put out another book, Survive the Coming Storm, Ebola Crisis, and that has been just flying off the shelves on Amazon. It's been a number one seller for a while, doing really good there on Amazon and everything. But I believe in teaching people and equipping people and and teaching them to to basically how to live live a right life in these last days. So that's kind of my focus, what I do. Uh, Prophezine.com is where I'm at. I'm on Facebook all over the place, um, but I love doing it. And and uh, I live down here in Central America now. You know, God called me out of the out of out of the country, and we're down here doing it. And just oh wow, it. Central America. Okay, that's that's good. Yeah. Um. I'm, all right. Costa Rica. Wow. Well, that's that's fantastic. Okay. Well, I, we really appreciate that. Your website, of course, is prophezine. dot com. Um, that's correct. the correct pronunciation, I take it. Okay. All right. Yeah. And of course, that's you there on the front page of your uh, of your website there with yep. the hat and glasses. All right. Good, folks. Yep. Go to prophezine. dot com. That's p r o p h e z i n e. dot com, For, and you'll you'll see Mr. Gano there and full living color. Uh, and, that, of course, we have with us John Price. Now, John, we've had on before. Uh, John, it's great to have you back, by the way. And I, I remember our program before when you were talking about your book. Uh, you know, and, and really, we, 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 got, we got a lot of response from that. Um, anything, well, John, uh, well, give, your, give our audience a refresher. Okay. And if you have any new um, books. First of all, I'd like to say that Ray Gano's newsletter weekly is terrific. And if, you, if a person doesn't have much time to keep up with the news, Ray's always on top of what's going on. I highly recommend it. 
Um, the book, The End of America, I uh, wrote in 2007, published, or started writing in 2007, published it in 2009, been through four editions of it since then. Uh, on Kindle, it, uh, under books that deal with Islam, it, it outsells the Koran, which makes my neighbors worry that they wonder what might happen. But anyway, uh, <laughs> um, the end of America essentially is an analysis of the 223 verses in Scripture um, which describe a great, powerful, end times nation, um, which I believe, if you study it in depth, would lead one to conclude that it's the United States because uh, mystery Babylon is identified in Scripture, but you have to have clues for any mystery. And God gives us 30 different, very specific clues uh, that we can talk about later because we have three hours. Um, to describe what that nation will be. Where is it located? What kind of people are in it? What does it accomplish? Um, And so forth. And when you look at those and you analyze them, I think that most people will come to the conclusion that these 30 clues specifically identify Mystery Babylon as the United States of America. It's not the Vatican. Uh, It's not the economic system of the world. It's not France or Italy or Brazil or Colombia. Um, unfortunately, it's us. Uh, we used to be the golden cup in God's hand, and that cup is no longer filled with uh, good things, but in fact, vile things. Um, and during this program, I know we're going to be discussing uh, what all the participants, the two Dougs and Ray and myself, think about uh, what I've just said, plus the timing and when will the daughter of Babylon Um, be destroyed, and what should Americans and Jewish people who live in America do in terms of the 10 verses that say to flee and so forth. So there are lots of terrific things to talk about, but they're very relevant things, as Ray pointed out, since we are clearly living in the end times. Israel's back in the land. Uh, The earthquake ratios and, and numbers are much higher. The uh, Ebola proves to us that when the Bible says there'll be Um, great plagues in the end times, those are certainly coming. So there are lots of reasons for us to have this discussion tonight, and I'm sure that before it's over, your listeners will literally get an earful, if that's a good expression, an earful of a lot of discussion concerning these important points. Absolutely. And uh, Mr. Price, we have uh, Mr. Woodward with us. And uh, just for everybody to let you guys know, Mr. Krieger's having difficulties with the Skype, so I'm going to call him through our studio now. We're all going to hear it ring, uh, and I didn't want to do that while you guys were talking. So I'm going to dial his, him up right now, and hopefully we can get him on the phone. Uh, Mr. Woodward, welcome. Hello, you've reached 916-996-1433. Hey. Yes. 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 Yeah, uh, that's strange. I wonder if Funny I'm trying help. to call in. <laughs> Funny how that works. Well, well, anyway, this is Doug Woodward. I'm a uh, uh, are you able to hear me okay, Joe? Yes, Great. we are. Um, I am yeah, excellent, Doug. Thank you. Well, I'm I'm excited, uh, really, really excited about tonight uh, about the show and and John Price and I've had the pleasure to visit a number of times. Uh, Ray, you and I have not, but I'm I'm certainly familiar with your work and uh, have been and reading you and reading your book on Ebola. <laughs> so I'm I'm pretty familiar with your work and I'm excited that, that you guys have joined us from a faraway land. And uh, anyway, so we have uh, John is, uh, has done some terrific work in his book. Uh, Dean McGriff, Doug Krieger, and I wrote a book called The Final Babylon, in which we agree with John in many, many areas. And uh, probably the only real question is just a timing question, and uh, that's something that we can, we can get into. But John's done a, a fine job of expositing the scriptures, the, uh, particularly the Jeremiah 50, 51, uh, s- several chapters in the book of Revelation, uh, a couple of chapters in Isaiah, Zechariah, and so on, the Psalms, uh, where he's identifying the, the daughter of Babylon. And, and uh, we, we frankly don't disagree with John on, on any aspect of the identification work that he's done. We, in fact, agree and have added some arguments of our own. So uh, anyway, so we're pleased to talk about that. I, I think the listeners will be, uh, they should find this discussion relatively difficult because we're talking about faith in America, and uh, uh, it is a, an ominous faith, and uh, we'll get into it as we uh, as we go along this evening. 
Well, that sounds great. And i got to tell you uh, and tell the folks this as well. When uh, John Price was on our program, uh, uh, I, you, know, you know what, John, I can't remember when you were on, but um, when we were talking about your book, I, I, w- I was ambivalent about America being Babylon. I basically, had, you know, I was in 90% agreement with America being Babylon, but the more I began to research it, I read your book again and, and just kind of, uh, talk, in interviewing other people, I'm pretty well convinced that uh, uh, you know what you say, what you've written is absolutely 100% true. I mean, you know, the, the timing aspect is always, I believe, is always going to be an issue, but uh, uh, you've convinced me. And uh, Ray, let me just say this: um, you, uh, you know, you're talking to a guy, and people are listening to a guy right now holding a uh, very cold cup of Starbucks coffee. And had I seen your latest uh, posting on prophezine.com about, well, Starbucks pro- produces this sodomite of my cross in commercial, I probably would not have uh, spent the two bucks for the cup of coffee. So, thanks for that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, wow, that, that's incredible news. Now, Joe is telling me we have, who else we have on? Uh, well, Mr. Krieger is with us. Mr. Krieger, okay. Yeah, you got Doug Krieger here. All right, Doug. All right. Yeah, well, I'll tell we you go. what we, we we you know we got a full house. Uh, Ace is well, over. Who do we have on the house? <laughs> well, <laughs> let's see here. You you want a head count, Doug, or what? <laughs> I'm sorry. I want to be playing in my house and fuck up. I think we got everybody but Dean McGriff. Dean's. Oh, that's L. D. Magoo too. He's waiting for the for getting in on the Skype call. Okay, I see. I'm chatting with him right now. He is uh, connecting with us, and we have Reagan. Yeah, we're we're calling in from all over the world here. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we're trying to balance. Uh, yeah, yeah, and we're trying to balance this out you know, between the, uh, the spreading the load, shall we say, and uh, it, it is interesting. Um, uh, all right. Uh, wow. I'm just watching Joe over here. He needs another arm and some more fingers. But uh, having said all that, and go ahead. Mr. Uh, McGriff with us. Okay, Are and Mr. Mr. McGriff? Uh, Dean McGriff? Okay. <clears throat> yes. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I'm 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 here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, good. Uh, D- Dean, welcome to the Hagman and Hagman Report. This, like, as I was saying, this is a full house. We've got we've got a tree. We've got uh, uh, we've got a number of people on. But, uh, sir, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell our audience basically who you are and uh, um, d- just a little bit about yourself. Sure. I. Uh, <clears throat> And basically, I retired from international business, spent most of my life traveling around the world, mainly Latin America, but also other places. So I bring a little bit of international perspective to our book, The Final Babylon. Um, <clears throat> have uh, a couple master's degrees, PhD candidate, and all that education. That doesn't mean a whole lot any longer. Um, <laughs> and uh, have been doing a prophecy website for about 20 years myself. And Doug Krieger and I have worked on one together for about the last 10. And uh, so that's the long and the short of it. I'm bilingual Spanish. Wish I was down in Central America right now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, of course, Mr. Woodward. And uh, uh, let's see. So we've got, just just so I've got an accurate head count, Joe, let's pay attention here now. Let's, uh, let's do this. We've got Ray Gano. We've got... Uh, the, okay, uh, John Price. We've got Mr. Doug Woodward. <coughs> Folks, you listening? You, you, you up with this? All right. Doug Woodward um, is here. All right, all right. Doug Krieger. Doug Krieger, right? Right. And Dean, and Dean McGriff. And, and basically, right. from multiple time zones, multiple locations all across America and Central America. My goodness. Okay. All right. So. Having said all of that, you, you guys don't need us, so we're going to go out for pie and uh, coffee. Uh, you guys talk amongst <laughs> yourselves. How's that? Uh, no, I, look, the, the first and foremost thing, and I think people really um, – who wants to speak speak on the conference? Uh, who among you wants to speak on the conference? Let's kind of – if we don't mind, I'd like to get that 
um, kind of out of the way, not out of the way, but really, you know, that's really, I'm really looking forward to that. And that's such a great, uh, just such a great lineup. I was looking at the schedule and I'm thinking, my goodness, to be in the shadows of the people there. So who wants to speak on about the conference that's coming up? Or start, Doug, anyway. Doug Krieger, uh, I'll be happy to, uh, I'll just start off. And Krieger, you, you stop me if I get something wrong. Um, yes, we are doing uh, a conference called the a World Turned Upside Down. Uh, the group is the Prophecy Forum. There are five of us in the group, plus uh, individuals like John Price, who's serving as an advisor uh, for our organization. Uh, this conference begins this Friday. Um, doors open at 11. The first presentation is with uh, John Haller um, at 1 o'clock. And uh, we go all day Friday, Friday evening, all day Saturday, and Saturday evening it can conclude about 8, 30, 9 o'clock. Um, so it's two full days. We have uh, individuals in addition to uh, Doug Krieger, Doug Woodward, John Haller. We have um, Gans Shimura, uh, who has uh, produced a couple of very important films, Age of Deceit 1 and 2. Um, we have Gary Winkleman, who is uh, one of our five directors who has had some incredible experience in uh, in Moscow and has uh, become quite a student of geopolitics around Russia. We'll be talking about that. Uh, then we have uh, Russ Dizgar, who is a, a minister that really has a worldwide ministry, very focused on uh, satanic ritual abuse, DID. He's been on your programs, I know, a number of times, uh, Doug. And then we have Dave uh, Dobbenmeyer, who is also uh, a part of uh, part of that group. And he'll be speaking. Dave has a ministry called Past the Salt Ministry, also located in Ohio. Uh, Chris Putnam, who's written several bestsellers. Uh, all these guys have been on your show. Chris has written Exo Vaticana and Petros Hermanus with Tom Horn. He's also right. recently published a book uh, through Tom Horn's publishing house, The Supernatural Worldview. Uh, he will be a part of the group. And then, of course, last but certainly not least, Bill Salas. Uh, Bill has written a number of, of best selling books in the prophecy genre uh, Psalm 83, Israelistine, most recently, The Prophecy of Elam, which is really Iran or Iran. And uh, it's, uh, it's focused very much on the conflict between Israel and Iran. And so the, the focus of the conference really are all the, all the incredible developments that have happened in the last six to eight months uh, in the geopolitical spectrum and the implications uh, on the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And um, I, I will be speaking on the fate of America, which is a, a topic that we're going to zero in on tonight. And um, as I've alerted John Price, I'm, I'm using a number of, uh, of items from John's book as, a, as part of the biblical exposition uh, on that. And then, uh, again, real fast, Dean the Griff, the Krieger and I wrote the final Babylon together. And, uh, and so, anyway, so that's the conference uh, this, uh, this week in Dublin, a.k.a. a suburb, suburb of, of Columbus. And uh, we, are, we are sold out. Uh, we have live streaming tickets available, and they're available at our website, uh, theprophecyforum.com, with a V, theprophecyforum.com. The, the uh, tickets are, are relatively inexpensive as conferences go, uh, 29 95 and it's uh, 15 sessions. And, uh, and then that will also be, uh, those sessions will be on demand for the next 60 days. So I think that's a, a pretty good summation of the conference, and, and uh, we obviously are, are here tonight to talk about some of the issues that we'll be discussing in depth this weekend. Okay, and that was that was just a beautiful summation about the conference. I could not have done that any better, and uh, I'm, I'm glad we have you folks to carry the weight tonight, uh, seriously. All right, well, you know, folks, we've got... Uh, We've got these very talented, very informed, and I mean informed gentlemen with us this evening. Um, I am excited to hear what they've got to say. Uh, I do have, a, a, of course, I received kind of the talking points for tonight, but um, uh, Mr. Woodward, uh, let me turn to you here and, and ask you, uh, I've, I've been reading some of your emails and, and some of the um, – uh, questions about Mr. Krieger too. Some of your questions, or some of the questions you've been prompting, or that you prompted, uh, or set for prompts for tonight. Um, I, it, it, either one of you take it um, when I ask this question, and then you can pass this along to the others. Here we sit in 2014, and I, and I was thinking about this today, and Joe and I were talking about this. Here we sit in 2014. 
we've gone through uh, really 13 years of, of new warfare, a new kind of warfare throughout the Middle East. We, um, you know, even a decade before that, of course, the first Gulf War and what have you. We've seen over the last, just the last few years, the reshaping of the Middle East through the uh, orchestrated Arab Spring. And all of this seems to be at the hands of the United States hyphen Western intelligence agencies and hyphen Saudi Arabia. It seems to be a Saudi Arabia agenda. And uh, we have also domestic problems here just ratcheting up and everything else. Now, having said all of that, and with that as a foundation, when we look toward the Word of God, we look toward the Bible, we look toward the mystery of Babylon as we talked initially. Uh, are we all in agreement, or are you all in agreement that Mystery Babylon, that America is in fact Mystery Babylon, or n even a variation of that, the daughter of Babylon, or is there is that a distinction that needs to be made? Um, I mean, I mean let, let, let's let's talk about that a little bit more, because I, I do think, by sure. the way, and let me just add this: I, I do think there is some confusion with respect to semantics. And if we can get that out of the way first, the, the daughter of Babylon, the, the horror of Babylon, mystery of Babylon, et cetera, et cetera. So if, if whoever wants to address that, I'm going to toss it out to whoever. Well, I, I think I, I need to jump in here. Can you hear me all right there, uh, uh, Doug? No. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, you know, there is, there is some, uh, I think that fundamentally what we have to come to terms with is that the Bible does speak about a great end-time world power that is going to have influence militarily, economically, politically, even religiously, uh, over the whole face of the earth. Now, it speaks of Babylon as a mystery. Really, the Bible is a tale of two cities. Ultimately, you have the uh, uh, New Jerusalem, the holy city, and that's juxtaposed over and against Babylon, that great city. So there's only really two cities that are dominating the uh, eschatological landscape at the end of days, these two cities. And behind these two jurisdictions and administrations, administration being a city, is the fact that you have... You have the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Son of Man in the midst of the churches, and then you have, ultimately, you have the Antichrist, uh, who becomes the beast, who heads up this end times uh, kingdom. And as the beast um, uh, comes up out of the uh, sea, uh, it describes the beast as having a coat of, of a leopard, the claws of a bear, and the mouth of a lion. These are all expressions of Gentile rule, rule power that, uh, that, that are seen in the book of Daniel. So just to say that the the beast doesn't have a kingdom is utterly erroneous. The entire thrust of Daniel has to do with Gentile world powers. What Revelation does, and what Daniel does as well, is that there is a king that is over this great end-time Gentile world power, and that king is called the king of Babylon, as far as political dominating uh, uh, power is concerned, and also the king of Tyre, which is the great commercial end time. And, of course, we know that the king of Tyre ultimately uh, is, is, is more, uh, more, he morphs into a, a being that ultimately is Satan himself. And so Satan stands admiringly on the seashore watching this beast coming up out of the sea, this great in time world power, which also has a king, the Antichrist beast, that comes out. Now, the mystery is solved when we realize that, if you would, Babylon the Great is a moving target. Okay, it started on the banks of the Tigris Euphrates. We can go all the way back to Nimrod. We can go all the way back to Babel. We go from there, and it begins to march westward. 
It marches westward in the Persian Empire, the feet of a bear, you know, the claws of a bear. It continues to march westward with Alexander the Great, the Grecian Empire. And then it continues to march westward with the, with the Roman Empire, and ultimately it's transplant in these United States of America, because we are in the main, in the United States, in North America, nothing more than a European transplant with a mixed multitude at the tail end of this. And so we see this dominating world power, Gentile world power, ever moving westward, and uh, uh, you know, eventually uh, uh, finding itself utterly entangled, enraptured. It's a tar baby. We cannot get out of the Middle East. Have you noticed that lately? We just can't get out of it because we're prophetically destined uh, to be involved and engaged in what's happening in the Middle East. So the mystery is very hard to pinpoint. Uh, Hislop did a great job on the uh, uh, apostate system and, and all of the pantheon of the gods that came out of Babylon, ancient religions of Babylon, Alexander Hislop. But as we continue to look at this thing, the old paradigm, as, as Doug Woodward is, is, is great at bringing out, was our, our, our you know, the late great planet Earth. You know, Antichrist and that great end time kingdom was going to come out of Europe. Well, today's Europe is completely uh, uh, inept at producing just about anything economically, militarily, or any kind of leadership. And so uh, the whole world looks to the United States of America, who at one time, it says of Babylon, that she was a golden cup in the hand of the Lord. And uh, you read in Jeremiah 50 and 51, but now her cup is full of abominations, putridities, which we're expo exporting all over the globe. 90% of the porn that is out there in the general public around the world comes right from here. We're affecting society after society economically, politically, and uh, for good or for evil, mainly for evil these days, unfortunately. That's what's happening. Exactly. And we're enforcing our social order upon the whole world. Great recap. Why don't we have John Price talk? John has done a great job of, of identifying about, I think, John, in your book, about 30. I picked about a dozen of, of these to include in my presentation for Friday night. But you might, um, you might hit some of the main attributes that certainly Jeremiah talks about because uh, you are so familiar with those. And uh, I think that would be, would be great here and, and – uh, so perhaps, John, you could spend, uh, I don't know, maybe take 20 minutes or so just to kind of go through and hit those highlights uh, on the attributes of the daughter of Babylon and Babylon the Great. Um, uh, <clears throat> thanks, Doug. Let me first of all talk about the language. Um, the daughter of Babylon is a phrase that's used to describe this great, powerful end times nation, primarily in the Old Testament. And then when you get to the New Testament, we find the phrase Babylon the Great, and Mystery Babylon. Um, they all, all three of those phrases, describe obviously the same country. Uh, let me hit these very quickly. And for your listeners, of course, everybody that's on this panel is very well acquainted with what I'm about to say. But for the listeners who may not be acquainted with what I'm about to jump into, God describes this nation as, as a mystery, the phrase we've used three or four times already, Mystery Babylon. But there's no good mystery unless there are clues, and he's given us those clues. So the clues that I'm going to touch on, keep in mind as you hear each one of these clues, who could this possibly apply to? Um, because for many years, because of Alexander Hislop's teaching in his book uh, that Doug mentioned, uh, people thought that all of these verses described the Roman Catholic Church. But in Hislop's book, he only referred to one of the of the 30 clues, that is the seven hills that we'll talk about in a second. So keep in mind when you hear these, are these clues descriptive of France or Italy or maybe even Russia, or do they apply most properly to the United States? So let me just hit them quickly. The first one, which I think is important since it's a birth clue, is that the daughter of Babylon is described as having a mother. Uh, for people who take the position that these verses really describe
describe ancient Babylon. They don't really apply to today. They'd have an historical problem because ancient Babylon never had a, a mother per se. The second clue, which is one that I think everybody immediately understands when they hear it, is that this country is described as the hammer of the whole earth. When I started working on this subject uh, about 25 years ago, I finally came to that clue, the hammer of the whole earth. Actually, it was 30 years ago. And I put the file away because at that time, the Soviet Union and the United States were literally both <laughs> in the world hammers. <laughs> got a dog. Somebody's got a dog. Animal, I can tell. We don't allow <laughs> dogs here. <laughs> wow. I'll tell you what, uh, I thought I was getting attacked from my headset here. Oh, my goodness. That's okay. <laughs> okay, well, let's go we back to the hammer of the whole earth. We need a hammer now, right? <laughs> there you go. The hammer of the whole earth is, is, the, is the clue. And the United States, we don't have to go into detail, uh, has military bases in, in 800 locations in the world, uh, except for the Soviet Union, which had a, a uh, naval base in the Mediterranean as of a, as a year ago. No other country has military bases around the world. We are clearly the hammer of the whole earth. We spend as much as everybody else on military preparedness. Uh, another clue is uh, scripture describes it in Jeremiah 50 as the hindermost of the nations. Um, when you look into the original language on this, it's not saying the least or the poorest, it's saying the latest. So of all the great nations, we're one of the youngest. And I think everybody would ad admit that if you compare the age of our country to other countries, we're a very young nation. Um, the next clue is it's a nation of great wealth and luxury. Actually, there are there are about 15 different verses in Scripture all referring to that country as having great treasures, dressed in purple, um, has great luxury, great wealth, and so forth. Um, and, of course, the United States uh, gross national product um, is so substantially ahead of the rest of the world that it's not even a close contest. Uh, when I published this most recently, the U.S. was $14 trillion GNP, and the next closest was China at $2.6 trillion. So that's how close and how large we are compared to the other nations. Another clue is that it's described in Jeremiah as a mingled people. Now, that's an unusual phrase to use for a country. I mean, people are either Italians or French, but mingled, except when you think about our country, of course, we're the great melting pot of the world. Um, this nation lives on many waters. And when you look at all the, the rivers and ports that the nation is on, our nation is on, we occupy 2% of the world's total land mass, um, yet we have a very high percentage of the world's fresh water supply. This nation is described as the center of world commerce. If you want to trade in pork bellies or copper or silver or gold or tires or cotton or almost anything, cocoa, soybeans, the trading floors for those are lo located in the United States. Another clue is it's the great voice. Whenever the president of the United States makes a comment, the whole world listens to it. Uh, here in Central America, we know exactly when our president has said something because it's reported widely. Um, we are, without any question, the great voice. If the head of Kuala Lumpur says something tomorrow morning, it may not make too much noise, too much news, but we certainly can make noise and news from the United States. Another clue is that we're mad on our idols. Uh, you remember how many days the United States news media covered Michael Jackson when he died? I mean, day after day, it was, they gave more coverage to him than Ronald Reagan when he died. Um, another one is that the daughter of Babylon mounts up to the heavens aren't too many nations in the world that can claim that they have a space program. Um, another one that's, that's specific exactly to the United States is it's where the nations of the world stream to meet. That's in Jeremiah 51. The nations flow together to meet. Um, the United Nations is one of only two organizations in world history that can claim that distinction. The other one, of course, was the League of Nations that met in Geneva, but it's out of business. Um, another one is that it's proud against the Lord. 
I think a preeminent clue is that it has a high Jewish population because there are three times in Scripture where God says to the Jewish population of this great, powerful, end times country to flee. Well, if you look at the listing of Jewish population worldwide, we have roughly 5 million people, approximately. Uh, And the next closest to that, the last time I looked, was France with 483,000 people. And then it goes down pretty quickly after that. We're a deep, deep water port nation. Hello. Yeah, John, is that? Yeah, Go ahead, John. I'm still here. Sorry about okay. that. We just moved Mr. Krieger from the the phone over to Skype, so he was that was him connecting uh, via Skype. Sorry <laughs> is, about is that. He, is he okay? Are you okay, Doug? <laughs> yeah. All, okay. right. All right, I'm almost re- finished. Re- almost finished with these. Okay. Okay. Uh, land of entertainment. That's described as uh, a land with full of harpers and musicians, but widely uh, entertaining the world as we do. Um, an, an additional clue that. I think it's relevant that we talked about it a second ago in in Hislop's book, is that it sits on seven hills or mountains or continents, depending on how you describe and define uh, the original language. But um, what Hislop did in the two Babylons that he published in 1858 was to take the one clue, uh, seven hills, if you take that interpretation, actually the more literal interpretation is mountains, uh, it's the same word that's used when Jesus was taken to a high mountain. And then based on that one clue, he went ahead and applied it to the Roman Catholic Church. Um, let's see, a couple other quick ones. It's described as a nation which is the mother of abominations. Now, it bothers me greatly as a as a patriotic American to have to say that my country that I love so much has become, as a couple of you have already mentioned, the mother of abominations. And when you look at the abomination of abortion that we have foisted on the world, when Roe versus Wade was handed down, there were only two countries in the world that under very, very limited circumstances, England and Finland, would allow abortion, and then only when two doctors said that the life of the mother was endangered. And then Roe versus Wade came down, and since then we've killed 56 million babies in the womb, 56 million. God says that that blood will have to be requited for. The blood cries out from the ground. And maybe later on we can talk about some of these in more depth. But what we have done on abortion to the world, including paying money to cause their legislatures in various countries to adopt pro-abortion legislation, um, is really reprehensible. Another abominable thing we do, uh, mentioned earlier, is pornography. We're the biggest exporter of pornography in the world. Um, Before the United States began, after 1963, to promote uh, a lot of these things we're talking about, the divorce rate in the world was pretty stable. It's pretty relatively low. And then after um, abortion came about and, and pornography became widespread and Hollywood began to glamorize adultery, uh, in graphic ways, and the world began to fall in behind the United States. And now divorce is, is a, a fact why, worldwide, and it's one of our products. The next one that we shouldn't be proud of, that I, I see it all over the world, is same-sex marriage. Um, it used to be back in 1986 in Bowers versus Hardwick that the United States said that sodomy laws were legal, um, but then that was overruled by Lawrence v. Texas in 2003, and they said, no, 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 Uh, actually, those laws are not valid and that you can make any choice that you wish to, and they struck down all the sodomy statutes. And at that time, when that case was argued, Justice Scalia said, I'll tell you where this is heading. It's heading to the legalization of same-sex marriage. And when he said that from the bench in 2003... There were literally people that looked at each other in the courtroom at the time, as I understand it, and a lot of us who looked at each other and said, same what? Same sex what? The the concept was almost alien. But now, of course, uh, 54% of all American 
um, young people below the age of 34 think that same-sex marriage is not only correct and should be allowed, but if you oppose it, that you're a bigot, according to the Barna study. Uh, we're also a nation of great violence. We can talk about that at some length, drug culture, witchcraft, etc. cetera. Um, these are all unfortunate abominations that fit within the category of mother abominations. So I conclude this by saying to, to your listeners, what other nation do these 30 clues apply to? That's, well, a, that's interesting. You know, John, that's, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Doug. I'm sorry. I no, no I just want one, I just want to yeah, punctuate with saying, saying that's a very interesting. Was, uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm I'm gonna ask. Go ahead. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna say this one thing. That, that's a very interesting point. If you take each point one by one, the totality of of evidence certainly does suggest in exactly what you're saying. Uh, I guess I really didn't need to validate that for you, but uh, you know, at, at least looking at it from an investigative point of view, certainly the totality of evidence makes a compelling argument. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, um, I was just going to comment the, the one thing that John did not mention, which is one of the most Im important of all the criteria, has to do with uh, the betrayal of Israel by this great nation. And, uh, John, you might talk a bit about that. I I just point out that there have been a lot of books about that, and we may want to drill down into that one item specifically, but you might you might mention that. Yeah, let me, let me hit that real quick. Um, the Bible says that the nation that we're talking about here, that great end times nation, Mystery Babylon, will come to a point in time when it betrays Israel. The word is actually that it's treacherous against Israel. And if you, for those who study scripture, and they know that Israel will someday have a peaceful period in which they're dwelling safely in their land, but Ezekiel tells us that unfortunately that peaceful period is interrupted as a great army from the north, Gog of Magog, um, Persia, which is Iran, uh, Libya, and other, other Muslim countries. Uh, they weren't Muslim at the time that Ezekiel wrote that, of course, but most of them are now will invade, and the, Israel will cry out and say, please, please, come and help us. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a verse which says, we looked for you, we cried out for you, our tears came down from our face, but you didn't show up. And why, why would we even think that we should have to go to Israel's defense? And, then, and the answer to that is that on March 26, 1979, uh, our president, representing our country, signed an agreement um, with the state of Israel with Mehaman began, in which we said that any time Israel is militarily invaded, that we, on an urgent basis, would come to its defense militarily. So if we get to the point in time when we don't do that, and we turn away from Israel, and we're treacherous, then the next scriptures that follow that specifically say that, that God will vindicate Israel by destroying the daughter of Babylon, Mr. Babylon. Now that's, that's a a hard thing to even have to talk about. And some people might say, well, wait a minute. Why should we have to pay just because our leader does something bad? Well, throughout history, whenever a leader of a country has led that country into difficulties, you can go back to the Second World War, et cetera, um, the country pays for it. And in this specific case, of course, uh, our president, should he be the one who betrayed Israel, was elected by the American people. So that's a quick answer. Very, very good. Um, who else wants to jump in there? Go right ahead. Uh, Ray, Doug, Dean? Uh, I have a question. I want to ask uh, uh, Ray Gano and uh, John Price why they moved to Costa Rica. <laughs> I mean, let's well, just get out there. Have you ever tried the pineapple and the coffee here? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're having some pineapple coffee. I know. <laughs> um, wait, wait, wait a second, John. John Price is living in Costa Rica too. Yeah. Uh, rumor oh. has it. It's true. It's true. Uh. <laughs> yeah, we hang out together. Actually, Ray's well, only about an hour drive from where we live. Yeah. So it they might have cars be considered down there? a conspiracy. Hmm. Do we have cars? what? 
Yeah, I, I said so. You have cars down there too. Uh, just cars, playing yes, off. Cars, yeah, yeah. cars. Hot and cold, wow. running water, and yes, yeah. we even have toilets in the house. Yeah. In the inside, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, inside, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm speaking to an email uh, emailer I got here uh, not too long ago about the uh, um, about Costa Rica and about certain Latin American countries. So um, inside joke, but uh, go ahead. I, I apologize to whomever I interrupted. It hey, raped on um, while you moved here. Uh, it was it was interesting. I mean, for a long time, Tracy and I knew that where we were living was not where we were to be permanently, and. Um, it's, we, we traveled all over the U.S. looking for where we should go, this and that and everything, and God just wouldn't open up any doors. One, one time we, uh, we even went to Belize, thinking because Belize has been on our radar for so long. And, uh, and then, you know, that didn't pan out. So all these things are not panning out, but we knew that you know, God released us from our church. He basically released us from our community. I mean, it, we were like orphans living in New Braunfels, Texas. And uh, it, it was interesting. Out of the blue, I got to get an email from a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, from me, me and John. And he writes me and he goes, dude, you need to come down to Costa Rica. And, and Costa Rica wasn't even on our radar. And, and we come down here, and for the first time ever, no doors were being closed. And Tracy and I... We kept doing checkups with each other. It's like, hey, Tracy, any no's yet? Hey, Ray, any no's? Nope, nope. But not any yeses either. So no doors being closed where we went to, like, Belize. We knew within four hours of touching down in Belize, we knew it wasn't for us and not where we would be and, and all this other stuff and many other places too. Well, anyways, we come down on our first recon trip, and, and we didn't get a no. And so finally, in January of 2012, was 2014? Yeah, 2012. We um, we we said, you know what? We got to use Fisher Cut bait, and it was strange because we flew out on January 12th or something like that, and we're staying at my son's house, getting ready to leave uh, out of Houston Airport, and we spent a couple days prior to to leaving, and a trip thing happened, and uh, my wife gets an email. She's the one who, who who screens a lot of the articles and everything that we get and, and everything for for the newsletter and stuff. And she goes, Ray, you've got to read this. And, and she says, you've got to stop what you're doing right now. Come over here, and you need to read this email from John Price. And John sent me an article called Flee, Seven Compelling Reasons to Move from America. And here Tracy and I are on our recon mission for our second, you know, Fisher Cut Bait recon, and I'm reading through all these things, and 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 and, it, and it's true. Um, I don't know if you guys got it, but just quick, real high points. You know, high point number one: God says do it. You know, there's a lot of people out there that you know, oh wow, should I do this? Should I do it? And and the thing is, is if God is calling you out, then move. But if God is not calling you out, don't move. And, you know, or if God's maybe calling you to a different part of the nation or something like that. Um, God is calling a certain group of people out, and he's telling a certain group of people to stay, and he's telling a certain people, uh, group of people to relocate. So, you know, if God's telling you to do something, do it. Obey him. But God says to do it, do it. And, and the thing that, that really bothered us is, is what's going on in America. I mean... Uh, Doug, when, when we were sitting there talking and everything, you were talking about the article that I just posted of Prophecy, talking about the, the, the stinking sick of sodomites and Starbucks and doing a stinking sodomite, pro-sodomite commercial and all that other junk and everything. I mean, the, the, the culture war in America is over. And, and I love it that the Republicans won, yay, but I, I, ha- I have very little faith in in them doing anything, I believe they're both cut from the same cloth. So I don't I don't really see anything happening. And then um, I think trouble's coming to our church. And so th- there's a lot of reasons why we moved. But the biggest thing is is that God said to do it. And and I'm one of these people that I, I I'm one of those guys who literally believe in the Bible. And you know we we are called to do things. We're called to be obedient. 
Christ says is, if you love me, obey my commandments. If you love me, do what my word says. Again, these are re-paraphrased, re- but these are things that I, I believe in. And so either I can choose to disobey God or I can choose, you know, to, to walk in faith and do what he wants me to do. And and it was amazing when we came down here for our January recon trip, all these things just fell into place. Boom, we had a house. Boom, we had a car. Boom, we had a, a P.O. box already. And we were just down here for a seven-day recon mission. And it's like, okay, God, I guess you want us to move to Costa Rica. And so we went back home, told the kids and everything, hey, we're moving to Costa Rica, which has always been kind of the joke with our family and everything. We've always told the family, yeah, one of these days we're just going to sell it all, pack it up, and go up and taco stand on the beach. Well, we kind of did. Not that we, you know, really live on the beach or anything. John does. But um, but we, we, we you know, we we made the change. We made we took the step out of the boat and walked on the water, and and I tell people now is that Tracy, you know, we've been walking on the water for so long with Christ, is that there's no land in sight or boat in sight, so there's no going back, and you know, kind of we burned the bridges, and or boats if you want to call it that thing. Um, but that's all I need to do. Go ahead. Let me jump in behind you here and, and give my quick summary of why we ended up here. Um, it, the pineapple is really good, and the coffee is terrific, but that's not the real reason. Uh, when we realized we needed to, to get out of the ministry of Babylon, we needed to check out, and we started by going international living conferences. Uh, one was in Ecuador, which we thought was fine. I liked Ecuador. It's kind of third-worldish. Uh, for people who don't have a lot of assets, it's a great place to live from a financial viewpoint, particularly an area like Cuenca, which is... Uh, south of Quito, about two hours, but um, very nice. It has a, a mall and a movie theater, and you know you, would, you wouldn't feel disadvantaged that it's pretty cheap to live there. You could rent a nice two-bedroom place for three or four hundred dollars. Um, and, and, and we thought we could possibly do this, but it didn't feel kind of like race. That it didn't feel like a really good fit. Uh, we went to New Zealand, which felt like a really good fit. We love New Zealand, and and frankly, if their laws were a little bit different. We would have moved there, but because of our age, uh, it's a socialized medicine country. You can't immigrate into New Zealand if you're above the age of 60 unless you bring a humongous amount of money, which we didn't have. Uh, We went to Belize, and I agree with Ray. It didn't take very long to realize that Belize was not the place. And then we came to an international living conference here in Costa Rica, and we said, "Hmm, that's really a great place. And we tried it for two weeks, then we tried it for two months. And then we moved here, and we've been living here for two years. In the interim, we've been to Australia and Uruguay just to check ourselves out to see what those countries would be like. And frankly, both Uruguay and Australia are 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 good choices. Uh, They're both good choices. They they are a freedom loving people, both of them. They don't have a lot of governmental interference with your life. Um, Living costs, depending on where you live in the two countries could be either similar to the U.S. or slightly less. Uh, Medical care is good. Um, Either one of those would be good choices. Uh, I get a lot of email, I'm sure Ray does too, from people saying, okay, I want to go, but I don't know where to go, how to go, Uh, and there are people who are assisting other people on how to do that. But the main thing that I say to people is just Google it. There's so much available that you can find out by doing research uh, and, and by chat rooms and so forth. And then once you decide you want to go to a place, get on the plane, go there, try it out for a few weeks, um, and see if you like it. And then if it works, try it out for a few months. But don't fall into the trap that a lot of people do of selling their home and taking their hunk of money and going into a different country and buying a house. Um, Not a good idea. With what's going on in the world today and what's likely to happen um, next year with the Shemitah coming up and so forth, uh, I recommend renting, 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 renting. Yeah. That's a very interesting. And I just want to say for the listeners out there who are listening from America, we get this question all the time, uh, wanting the real-life experiences of uh, at least two individuals now uh, tonight telling their experiences about why they left and where they went. And it's I find it fascinating, uh, the proximity uh, with respect to your, your 
ultimate uh, uh, locations and, and how you got there. So, folks, just uh, hopefully the listeners who have asked this question to us and to other guests, hopefully you got a lot out of the testimonies you, you just heard. Um, gentlemen, I, I'd like to just... Uh, just we're at the top of the hour already. Uh, when we come back, we can just open it wide open, full bore. We've got uh, Mr. Ray Gano, Doug Woodward, uh, Doug Krieger, Dane McGriff, and John Price with us. This is a full house tonight. We've got a full boat tonight, folks. You're listening to a very special edition of the Hagman and the Hagman Report up against the top of the hour. Ladies and gentlemen, hour number two of the Hagman and Hagman Report on this Wednesday, November 12, 2014. We are joined by some very special guests tonight. And it sounds like somebody just dropped off, or I hope that's not me that dropped off. Um, you can still hear me, Dad? Okay, good. Uh, we have Mr. Douglas Woodward, Doug Krieger, Dean McGriff, John Price, Ray Gano, and I think I covered them all, and me and my father. Um, somebody just dropped off the call, and I'm not sure which one it was, but uh, we'll get them back. Uh, trying to get back on. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll keep my eye out for him. And, uh, you know, uh, reading some emails during the break and, and comments from the interactive chat, the chat was uh, was saying how we started talking about Babylon and went to Costa Rica and wondered if we could get back into, uh, you know, Babylon. And, you know, uh, John Price, you did an excellent job of uh, ex- explaining and laying out, um, you know, the 30 signs that uh, point to the nation of Babylon in the end times. Um, I'm going to leave it open to uh, whoever else wants to take it while we're uh, waiting for, yeah, it looks like Mr. Woodward to come back on, Uh, Mr. Gano or Mr. Krieger. uh, What's your thoughts about uh, Babylon, the daughter of Babylon, and Mystery Babylon? This this is Ray here. Um, I see it as the daughter of Babylon. Yeah, yeah, it's correct. Um, I see it as the daughter of Babylon. Uh, Like many of you, John Price's book, had had great influence on me, and I come out of the standard Hal Lindsey, you know, Jack Van Impey ideas, and all this other stuff. And and it wasn't until I read John's book, and and I'm one of these people. I don't just because someone writes a book doesn't mean they're right. I'll, I actually go through, and as I'm reading their book, I whip open the Bible and I check what what people are saying. And so I really appreciated John's book, and and what happened is is that he presents, I believe, what is it, John, thirty proofs, yeah. and and okay, let's just say that maybe third, let's just say twenty of them are completely accurate. You know what? Twenty is still a great number, and and you know you this is this is something that is happening, and and if it wasn't until the twentieth century that we wouldn't have been able to really look at this. And so this this is a mystery. Paul talks about, you know, uses the word mystery because it's something that is not known at that present time. Grace through faith, salvation through grace through faith was a great mystery. The Old Testament patriarchs and everything didn't really understand it. It was a mystery. And and so same thing with with uh, mystery Babylon or the daughter of Babylon. And and like it or not, when when you read the scripture and you read these proofs, because I've been studying scripture for a bazillion years now, and well, not necessarily a bazillion years, but <laughs> you understand what I mean. But I've here I here I am, a student of Bible prophecy. I've been doing this for 25 years, and I've been reading this daughter of Babylon, daughter of Babylon, daughter of Babylon, and it really never struck home with me. The light bulb never really went off until I read John's book. And then it's like, oh, my goodness, John is right. And then when you go back and truly search the Scripture, you see that it is true. And, and, and again, I'm a person that if the Bible is there and the Bible is saying it, then who are we to ask? Who are we to question? Uh, we either take the Scripture at face value or we don't. And, and so I see the daughter of Babylon being, being America. And and it is, we are living in the last days of the last days. And what people need to start thinking about is what are they going to do with this knowledge? I mean, it's all wonderful and great and everything to talk about it, but you can talk something to death. And I love what you were saying there, Joe, uh, right there. We need to start being as men of God, start standing up and start doing something again. And... Uh, 
tell you what, I've talked enough. I'll hand it over to Doug Krieger. Doug, go. <laughs> I'm still. I, I think I got the connection that when you guys moved down there to Costa Rica, it had a lot to do with clean Babylon. <laughs> I wanted to hear that, and I think I finally heard it very clear. And uh, but it's good that you've also mentioned too, Ray, that it's the leading of the Lord, how the Lord might be leading uh, some to physically remove themselves. Uh, from uh, Babylon the Great uh, for the purposes that God has chosen in you guys' lives. That's, that's, that's a remarkable thing. I, I don't think that we've ever had a conference uh, in this country that I know of that has sort of focused in uh, prophetically on uh, Mystery Babylon the way that this uh, conference is going to be able to do, in particular some of the the uh, uh, material that uh, Doug Woodward is going to be bringing out about Mystery Babylon. And uh, we're very clear that when she breaks up into three parts, that obviously that not only constitutes the fact that it is a complete uh, destruction of Babylon the Great in the last days, but also the fact that she is a tripartite, tripartite, if you would, um, uh, empire that is... uh, uh, religious, religiously apostate, uh, commercially ex- exploitive, and politically corrupt. And all three of those are judged in Revelation 17, 18, and 19. And that's just good old-fashioned dispensational teaching, but it's uh, been true tie uh, to 150 years or more, and it's still true to this day. And it's the fact that uh, from the very beginning in the founding, if you would, of the new world by the European monarchs, there were three things that went together in always, uh, even from the Massachusetts Bay colonies on, uh, whether it was uh, Christopher Columbus, whoever, it was the cross, it was uh, commerce, and it was the crown. Uh, the cross, commerce, and crown, all three uh, went together in uh, the um, uh, conquering of the Americas uh, by the Europeans. And uh, for good for, uh, or worse, that, that was the case. And I think that all of us uh, are uh, uh, <coughs> struggling, have struggled, uh, by being the fact that you know, we're a, a pretty, uh, I would have a pretty red-blooded uh, patriotic Americans, to find ourselves in this maelstrom, uh, in this city of confusion, which is mentioned in Isaiah 24 on the final judgment of the Gentile world powers, which is mentioned in Isaiah 24, she's called the city of confusion. And from the very beginning, the Tower of Babel has been representative of that very confusion. And then ultimately, she is called the city of desolation. And so... So God doesn't have any pleasure in in uh, that kind of judgment. But at the end of days, uh, we look at uh, a number of us are uh, attorneys, John Holler and of course John Price. And um, but this is a this is a uh, a cosmic courtroom that we find ourselves in at the end of days. And the Judge of all the earth is calling forth his uh, witnesses, his testimony, his prophets who are going to give the evidence against that great city. And they're being called to witness, just as Jesus bore the testimony. It's the testimony of Jesus in the spirit of prophecy. We're called upon to be a prophetic statement and witness against that great city. Make no doubt about that. And by the way, uh, the enemy of our souls is going to do everything he can to tamper with the witnesses and to intimidate them, uh, and to continue to accuse the brethren until this thing is down for a final showdown. Now, there's a lot of opinion on this, but I'm just going to say this. We are asked upon to bear witness to the Word of God, just like John the Beloved on that Isle of Patmos, and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. One of the things about the testimony of Jesus Christ with regards to that great city, Babylon the Great, or religious apostasy, when Jesus came into Jerusalem on that donkey, for three and a half days he gave an unmitigated testimony 
He took on the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the scribes, the chief priests. He took on the Romans. You name it. He, by the way, he took on an attorney. No offense, guys, okay? But he took them all on. He gave his testimony for three and a half years and culminated it in that last burst of three and a half years in Jerusalem, which he knew would lead him to the cross. And, of course, it did. He gave his life for, that, for, for us all that we could be talking about. Now he asks us in the end of days to come forth and testify <coughs> against that big city. Now, Joe, you had that little uh, piece about uh, the Laodiceans there. You know, they always get a bad rap. But there were ten major persecutions in the Roman Empire that we know of uh, that were very outstanding. And the last one was with uh, Diocletian in about 303, 343, up to 325 BC, A.D., and uh, they came to Laodicea, and Ray Stedman had a, a wonderful Bible study on this. It was, it was called uh, Laodicea Always Gets a Bad Rap. But what happened was he enjoined the church in Laodicea to buy of me gold tried in the fire. And what happened to the church literally in Laodicea under the persecution, <laughs> under Diocletian in the eastern part of the empire was that they came, the proconsul, the Roman proconsul came to Laodicea, gathered all the elders together and all the citizens, and said, okay, now you have to offer a grain offering uh, to the emperor. Uh, this is in part of Roman Empire worship. And the uh, elders were clear they couldn't do this. And uh, so they said, we can't do that because we worship the one true God. We can't, we can't you know, we're, we're, we'll submit, but we're not going to worship the emperor. Uh, and the thing of it was is they said, okay, then we're going to uh, take one of your uh, uh, children here, uh, a 12-year-old lad, and we're going to toss him in the fire. If you won't toss your grain offering in the fire, we're going to toss him in the fire. And what happened was that the, the, the 12-year-old said, as his mother was in tears, he said, I, uh, I'm going to a better place, mother. Don't weep for me. And the entire church in Laodicea was martyred. Are you aware of that? The entire church was martyred. And they bought wow. gold. And so praise God for the church in Laodicea. And they, they paid the uttermost price, and they gave witness to the Savior. Oh, isn't that wonderful? I mean, I'm not saying about their martyrdom, but it is a glory to the Lord that they paid the price. And we're a witness to him to the end. Hey, Doug, you know, uh, this is Doug Woodford. We might uh, talk a, a, a little bit about what Ray was, was bringing up, which is the sort of the standard scenario, kind of the old school view, um, and just contrast it a bit with the fact that, you know, it's, it's not just to us, but there's been quite a number of author, researcher, writers, and scholars that have, over the last 50 years, have to some extent, postulated and to some extent advanced a very firm argument that they believe that America uh, is, in fact, the fulfillment of Mystery Babylon of the Last Days. Um, I just talked for a moment about some of those people. A number of them have uh, have passed on. Uh, certainly, uh, Dr. Stan Monteith just passed away mm -hmm. just the uh, last few weeks. Uh, he certainly uh, believed that, uh, you know, really kind of began back in the late 1960s uh, with Frank Logsdon, who was the pastor at the, at the Moody Church, uh, J.R. Church, who I was uh, you know, privileged to work with some at Prophecy in the News. J.R. Uh, also believed that it's very conceivable that America uh, is the fulfillment of Mystery Babylon. Uh, um, you know, if you ask Tom Horn, Tom is going to say, so his book, uh, Apollyon Rising 2012, emphasizes the same thing. In fact, there's, you know, there's really probably a dozen or more really well-known authors that have written for the last 50 years countering the, you know, the, the view of, of our good brother Hal Lindsey and uh, David Jeremiah and, uh, oh, a number of folks that uh, they really believe that America is uh, Mystery Babylon. So it's not... It's not just John Price, although John's done a wonderful job of, of pulling together things. Rick Coombs, I believe, and I don't know if, if – I know Rick has been sick. I don't know if Rick is still oh, with Rick, us. Oh, Rick passed, Rick passed away. Yes, okay, so Rick has passed away recently. 
Yeah. Uh, but he had, had uh, on his website, had put together, I think it was 70 reasons why the USA is Mystery Babylon. So um, and certainly in, in our book, The Final Babylon, we talk uh, a lot about the reasons why we believe that is the case, biblical reasons as well as sort of just the geopolitical reasons, and we touched a bit on those. But um, I won't I won't wax lyrical on this anymore. Just to make the point though that that there have been a lot of a lot of scholars that have believed what we're testifying to that uh, we don't like it. We wish it weren't so. But America is the hammer of the whole earth. It it is the hindermost of nations. It it is the daughter of Babylon. And uh, and so consequently, the question of what we should be doing now is of vital uh, utmost importance. Uh, guys, i got a, a question here, and this is uh, from some of the listeners, uh, too. They were inquiring and wanting to know where the Church of Rome, where the Vatican fits into all this. Uh, and I'll, I'll toss this to you first, John Price. Um, for maybe 15 years, when I taught my Bible study, when we got to verses that dealt with Babylon, daughter Babylon, and so forth, I would say, now, of course, this is the uh, Holy uh, Roman Empire. Excuse me, I don't think so. The uh, Roman Catholic Church. Excuse me. Um, and um, that came from Alexander Hislop's book, as was mentioned earlier, because because he said it. He took one clue and applied it to the whole church. Problem is that if you look at the church, you can't apply it to all of these other clues. It just doesn't fit. It's not the hammer of the whole earth. It doesn't have a high Jewish population. You can just go down the list, and pretty quickly you can dispose of the fact that it's it's not it's not the Vatican. Now, where does the Vatican actually fit into all this? I think that the Vatican pretty clearly uh, fits into other other prophecies. And with what's happening now, with the major effort to cause Chrislam to emerge in the world. Um, you can begin to see that that uh, that when the Bible talked about a great apostasy in the end and a falling away and so forth, that we're beginning to see uh, the beginning of that. As a matter of fact, the National Cathedral, which has been described as America's church, and if you've ever been there, it's really imposing big Gothic cathedral that sits up above Washington, D.C., um, is about to host and allow a Muslim worship, if worship's the right word, uh, religious ceremony without any Christian involvement. Now, I can imagine how many of our forebears are twisting. Anyway, uh, it, it's it's an amazing proposition that that Christians are saying, you know what we really need is to get together with with the Islamic faith when they obviously have not read anything about the history of 1,300 plus years of bloodshed and beheadings and um, the most unbelievable uh, history when you really read it, and also just pick up the Koran and begin to read it and see what it says. It's very difficult to read. Um, But I guess my point is that I don't see anything regarding the daughter of Babylon specifically that relates to the the Vatican, Um, but others may have other views of that. Let me just uh, pipe in here. This is Dean. Um, you know, one of the <clears throat> reasons why we end up with uh, such a, a hodgepodge mess, if you will, is that, um, you know, and Daniel, I love that at the last chapter, it says, <clears throat> this is going to be sealed up until the very end and concealed, and it's not going to be revealed until you have a need to know. I was in military intelligence, you know, <laughs> you have to have a need to know. Nobody had a need to know until now, because it is the end. So a lot of people, Hal Lindsey and others, you know, going back in time, tried their best, but they were blinded by taking a look at things from their own lenses. And at that particular time, the historical situation at the moment. And uh, we, we're, we're still myopic as Americans. We fail to see that, in a sense, <clears throat> we really are European. We could well be that little horn of the ten that, is ro- that, that rose up and is dominating all the others. So everybody has been expecting the Antichrist to come out of Europe, but Europe <laughs> moved across the ocean, if you will, and melted into this great big country. And uh, then the other thing that 
everybody is looking at is they're looking at, well, obviously <clears throat> America's just got to be destroyed. It's got to be wiped out because it doesn't fit anywhere. It's not mentioned in Scripture, even though you guys have done such a great job showing that, yeah, as a matter of fact, it really is mentioned in Scripture in many, many ways. <clears throat> but, um, you know, we, we uh, you know, fail to see that we're European in, in culture and language and religion in economics, in law, and in every way. And so, you know, Babylon of the last days <clears throat> dominates the whole world. And for those of us that have traveled a lot, <coughs> excuse me, we've seen that domination of our culture. It's on the TV, it's on the radio, it's on the billboards, no matter where you go in the world. You know, it's it's America. It, it's not Chinese or Japanese or, or Russian or any other. It's it's our culture and our goods and our ideals and everything that's that's out there for the whole world to see. And then well, the other thing we might want to get to later <clears throat> is uh, what about America? Is it going to crash and burn? And uh, that's another <laughs> another interesting story. But uh, you know, none of these countries, you know, Rome took a thousand years to fall, and uh, many other countries are. Uh, Japan started to fall 25 years ago, but it's still the fourth largest economy in the world. So none of these things happen nearly as quickly as we think. And there are many, many things that are happening today that <clears throat> give America an edge over the whole world, not the least of which is our energy. And uh, this is going to really hurt the Middle East as price of oil drops and so forth. But the United States is positioned to continue dominating very much so for the next uh, 10 or 15 years, and I don't think we need much more time. And if I can jump in here, uh, Dean, uh, uh, Dean McGrath wrote, folks, wrote an interesting article, Is America on the Brink of Collapse? And that's that can be found at thetribulationnetwork.com with hyphens between the and the tribulation and the network. So it's the hyphen tribulation hyphen network dot com. Very interesting. Is America on the brink of collapse? Which speaks to what was just uh, what was just spoken. Uh, Mr. Woodward, faith happens dot com. Faith hyphen happens dot com. Uh, what say you with respect to? Uh, but by the way, folks, Mr. Woodward, in case you don't know, you've been living under a rock for the last uh, number of years. Is the author of eight books: Blood Moon, Lying Wonders of the Red Planet, Power Quest, books one and two, and so on. Uh, co-author, interestingly, and this is what we're talking about tonight: the final Babylon. America and the coming of Antichrist. Uh, so, Mr. Woodward, what do you say about where we're at with this right now? With uh, what you just heard, right, right. Well, I think the you know one of the, the real questions that we're trying to drill down on here is is <coughs> what's the alternative? You know, um, yeah, I think another question we may want to spend maybe most of the last hour together is really talking about timing. But I I feel like we still need to, to hit. You know, kind of the issue of Europe, uh, why Europe is, you know, is, it, it continues to decline, um, both, um, you know, economically, um, you know, GDP-wise, America over the last 10 years has stayed, uh, in terms of the percentage of the world GDP, has stayed pretty consistent between 25 and 27 percent. Europe continues to decline. Um, militarily, the United States, when it comes time for an operation, even like the operation against Gaddafi in Libya, um, what was it now, 18 months, 24 months ago, Europe couldn't even muster the military to do that. Uh, you know, the United States had to lead from behind to help facilitate it. Um, Europe is not a superpower in, in many respects. And, uh, and so it doesn't have the cohesion necessary to, uh, to dominate the world. Uh, only the United States. I know there are uh, a number of brothers uh, that uh, Joel Richardson, um, uh, Joel Rosenberg, and uh, Waleed Shubat that talk a uh, considerable amount about other alternatives, such as, you know, could Mystery Babylon be uh, Saudi Arabia? Could it? Could it be Turkey? Could the Antichrist be Muslim? <clears throat> we just don't see the prophecies that John went through so well uh, as being fulfilled. Uh, by, you know, Turkey. I mean, Turkey does not have a global military. It does not have the ability to influence politics, geopolitics. 
Uh, it's a, at best, as a regional power. Its heyday uh, ended about 100 years ago. And uh, so we just don't see that as a, as a possibility. But if you look at the United States, um, the United States continues to be dominant across around the world, uh, both commercially, uh, politically, and militarily. And um, Chris Putman, who's going to be with us in Dublin, he wrote a forward for our book, The Final Babylon, and, and that was kind of the point that he made that we put on the cover of the book, that you know, if the Lord returns in the next decade or two, you know, our thesis about The Final Babylon is not just uh, compelling, it's necessary. And so uh, we think the, the arguments are extremely, very, very, very strong geopolitically, as well as biblically, that you know America is the power base of the Antichrist uh, in these last days. One of the Can things I, I uh, uh, highlight here, and we've we've missed it somehow in our interpretations of Revelation 18, 17, and eighteen in particular, and that is there is this woman that rides the beast. Now Dave Hunt, as uh, John Price has brought out for many many years. We've been pinning the Mystery Babylon uh, ticket. It's Luther, uh, Calvin, uh, a lot of the Reformers, uh, the historicists in particular, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists, which come from that tradition as well, uh, pin the tale on the Roman Catholic Church that she is Mystery Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, period. But as you look at Revelation 18 and 17, two things come out of there. This woman is riding a beast. The beast is obviously the state connected to the Antichrist with the ten horns and the eleventh horn and so forth. But who is that woman with the golden cup in her hand? It is very clear to me as I've studied the scriptures over the years that the, the metaphors and the types and shadows that are depicted in the Revelation is that this is an apostate religious uh, entity that is supported by the state in one way or another. Now, the greatest picture of that, one of the greatest pictures of that for certain, in the uh, Hebrew scriptures is Jezebel and her coming into the ten tribes of Israel, uh, her commercial uh, marriage with Ahab, King Ahab, and her father, Ithbel, who was the uh, king priest who assassinated uh, the king of Tyre and became uh, not only its chief priest, but its king, the king of Tyre, she well knew the mixture of church and state, if you would. She knew the way it operates. It is she who perpetuated the temples of Baal and Ashtaroth and the 400 and the 450 male and female prostitutes where they were having commercial religious experiences in these uh, dens of iniquity and in their uh, uh, channeling the spirits uh, doing these these uh, sexual acts literally and it was Elijah who exposed the whole uh, circumstance when 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 the the uh, you know when the, the daughter of Tyre came into Israel, it wasn't that she was going to eliminate the religion of Yahweh. She was, in fact, wanted a mixture. She wanted to mix the religions of Baal and Ashtaroth and of the Phoenicians, the Canaanites, with that of Israel. That was the apostasy. And the fact that when you read Revelation, that she is, uh, the beast turns on her, and kills her, and slays her, and then uh, burns her with fire. That's what happened to Jezebel. Is that you, Jehu? Uh, are you come to me? And she was thrown out of the window by the eunuchs. Her body was on the eaten by dogs. This is why there's no more dogs, by the way. No dogs allowed. It's really going to be tough on people like Dean McGriff. But no dogs allowed in the New Jerusalem. Because there's no apostasy there. You don't have to have dogs because there's no apostasy. She was burned with fire. But I want to read a verse here, then I'll wrap it up here, that I don't know if we've ever been able to see this before. But it says this in Isaiah chapter 23, just prior to the judgment, the final judgment, impending judgment of the earth 
in Isaiah 24. You read this in Isaiah 23. And listen to this. And now it should come to pass in that day that Tyre will be forgotten 70 years according to the days of one king. At the end of 70 years, it will happen to Tyre as in the song of the harlot. Take a harp, go about the city, you forgotten harlot. Make sweet melodies, sing many songs that you may be remembered. And it shall be at the end of 70 years that the Lord will deal with Tyre. Now listen to this now. She will return to her hire and commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. Now, when does that happen? And when is she going to return to her hire at the end of seven years? I believe those 70 years, brothers, could be easily that 70-year time frame between 1948 and add 70 on that, and you're looking at 2018. It could be that at the end of the 70th week of Daniel that we're talking about here. But she's going to commit fornication with all the kingdoms on the face of the whole earth. That's never happened before. It will come about that she will return to her hire. Now, she's been hiding from us. She's going to return to her hire. She's going to be riding that beast, and the beast is going to turn on her. Now, this whole thing about this, can't we all just get along in this uh, religion of so-called tolerance and Chrislam and this mingling together of this one apostate religious system, is that riding of the beast? That's what we see. She's riding the beast, and she's returning to her hire at the end of 70 years, and she's going to commit this fornication with all the kingdoms of the earth on, on the face of the whole earth. But we haven't emphasized that. And her thing is commercialism and religious apostasy. This is what she wants. And she wants to mingle it in with the religion of Yahweh, if you would, Christianity. And this is what we're facing in the end of days, and she's going to return to her hire. But the, the symbolism and the metaphors, brothers, that are used of this very clearly are speaking of Jezebel, who came into Israel and apostatized the religion of Yahweh. And what we need to be is we need to be those Elijahs that will be willing to stand up and take a stand so that when Ahab sees us coming down the valley, he's going to say, is that you, Elijah, that troubles all Israel? And what's our, going to be our answer? You better believe it is. That's us. You nailed it. Okay? Now, you shut off this water for three and a half years, according to James 5, Elijah. We're desperately in need of water. Well, listen, let's get rid of these priests of Baal in a hurry. And that's what happened. There was a final showdown. And in the midst of all the showdown... Here comes a guy by the name of Obadiah, who is the spiritual counselor of, guess who? Ahab, of course. And he takes a hundred prophets of the Lord and hides them in two caves, 50 in this cave and 50 in that cave, as if they're going to be a testimony. And then he says to Elijah, Elijah, is that you? Everybody's asking these questions. Is that you, Elijah? In hopes that, uh, I hope to God it's not him, right? But it is Elijah, and we need to be those Elijahs to stand and oppose in this way. And, and, and then you're going to have these compromisers that are going to say, hey, I've known the Lord for my youth. Now, you want me to tell Ahab you're around, Elijah? He's going to kill me. Yeah, he just might do that, Obadiah. But you got, and then Obadiah says, yeah, but I saved all of these prophets, and they're still in the caves. I've been giving them water and bread. What a testimony. And he was a spiritual counselor to the 70 sons of Ahab. And you guys know what happened to those 70 sons. Jehu slayed them all. They were all slain. So much for Obadiah's spiritual counsel. That was the end of that. All right. You you're, pretty emph you're pretty emphatic about all of this. Um, but go, go ahead. I think it sounds like I interrupted you during a thought. So go ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm through. I'm through yeah, with that. But I'm through with Ahab. <laughs> and I, was, I was going to comment and ask maybe John Price to comment. The one verse I was going to read to kind of 
pull together what you were saying. I I find that the the metaphor of the woman um, of you know that this woman is it's in the Old Testament as well as in the Book of Revelation. The the verse from Isaiah forty seven one, and I'll, let me read it and I'll make a comment. It says, "Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans." For thou shalt uh, no more be called tender and delicate, Isaiah 47, 1. You, you do see this woman, and she doesn't just have a single name of the daughter of Babylon. She's also called the daughter of Chalde- the Chaldeans. She's also the princess of Tyre. Um, you see this, you know, uh, Ishtar, uh, Ashtar. You see so many names in the history of mythology. Uh, it is Libertas, the... The Statue of Liberty. It's the you know, Libertas is is on the the, the capital uh, top of the Capitol dome. You see this throughout mythology, but uh, it's it's fascinating to me that you see this metaphor used in Scripture and it ties into uh, this mystery that the whore of Babylon. But uh, yeah, again, John call, uh, John Price, you might comment on that. Actually, Doug, I was about to say exactly what you said. Ah, okay, go so, ahead. Well, go ahead. So, it's either great minds running in the same track or the blind yeah. leading the blind. I'm not sure yeah. which. Yeah. Fools seldom differ. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> if I can jump in here real quickly, something that, that we need to do, and I know all of us are doing this right now, is we, we need to take a, a push on actually educating the people. Because what we're doing is we are battling a a mindset that has been with us for gosh almost 150 years, right. and so what what we're battling against is what I call parrots teaching parrots, and and so a lot of people are are promoting this. It was like I forget who said it here. Uh, America's not mentioned in scripture. That is a a parrotism. And and these are things that we need to start kind of attacking head on. And and when someone says, "Well, America's not in script," no, it is. Boom, 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 boom. Mm-hmm. And and start educating people because until we start educating people and and helping them basically turn on the light bulb or have this paradigm shift in thought, they're never gonna they're never gonna research this. They're never gonna see this stuff themselves. And so we, as educators and teachers and preachers and authors and writers and and everything, we have the chance to to truly educate. And I think that's that's the focus that I've been push, pushing a lot is education, so that people can then have answers. Because a lot of people are going to these Bible prophecy conferences. And I get emails. I'm sure all you guys get emails when someone, oh, uh, so-and-so says that. Well, you know, XYZ Bible prophecy teacher says, no, that's wrong, and blah, 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 because my book says this. And it's not on these guys. You know, it's not bad on them or anything. It's just this is what these guys have been taught. And 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 it's something that I've been challenging myself over the years. It's like, you know what, I need to get away kind of from what I've been taught and start looking at these things. I forget who brought up the Daniel verse about, um, you know, opening the opening up the scriptures for the last days. You know, great men like Hal and and Jack Van Impey and Grant Jeffrey and all these other great men who who have kind of laid the the groundwork. You know, the light bulb wasn't on back then, and and now so many things are different now, and and we're learning so much more and seeing so much more that we, we need to take on this challenge of truly educating the people so that we can help them and help them see that the U.S. is the daughter of, uh, of Babylon. Mm-hmm. You know, one other thing that... Uh, I was going to make the comment just about the... Uh, we need to bring up the issue of the rapture because certainly one of the, of the key tenets of the, the views that Hal Lindsey, Grant Jeffrey, David Jeremiah... Uh, a number of great men of God that have spoken and done wonderful work in teaching eschatology. Uh, one of the elements that uh, that they believe is the one of the re- key reasons why America diminishes, and they believe isn't mentioned in Scripture, is because they believe America is so full of Christians that when the rapture occurs, uh, America is decimated. 
Now, you know, I don't necessarily agree with uh, with Dean and Doug, my co-authors, on the timing of the rapture, uh, although over time we may be getting closer together. But uh, we really collectively challenge the idea that America is so chock full of Christians that the rapture will eliminate America as a world power. Um, can I – again, that's that's one of my hot buttons right there. Is, and, and a lot of people ask, well, why, Ray, why don't you preach on, on the rapture anymore? And, and I, I truly – as much as this sounds bad and everybody's going to now hate me and call me a heretic tomorrow morning, you know what? The rapture is a non-issue. It really is. Because if you really take it down to its core, you know, we're here all arguing over when and this and that. You know, let's stop wasting time. God is the only one that knows, period, except the fact. We all have our pet theories. And we are wasting so much time with our pet theories and arguing and dividing and all this other junk that all this other stuff like America and the daughter of Babylon is going to is complete being completely washed over. Yeah. And and so what when when we as teachers start interjecting the rapture and everything, it's all fine and dandy. I I pray for a pre, I really do, but I'm prepared for a post. You know, <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. And and to to I have people that write me. Oh Ray, why should I care about this anyway? Because the rapture is going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. And 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 you would not believe how many emails I get to that effect. You do. And and it's just you know we need to take the rapture out. It's a non-issue. It re- it's it's great for its own issue, but when we mix it in with America and all this other stuff, the way that you combat and educate is you say, hey, listen. Who's got the magic crystal ball here, okay? Doug, do you got the magic crystal ball? No. Joe, do you got the magic crystal ball? When is the rapture? Show me the date. Show me the time. When is it? Nobody's got the crystal ball, so who cares? Let's move on. And and let's stop focusing on this issue that is basically a non-issue. It's in God's timing, not ours. So who cares? And I know this is radical sounding, and again, people are going to call me a heretic tomorrow. Oh, right, you're you're a pan tribber now, and everything. No, it's just, <laughs> just a non-issue Brilliant. because we I agree. We, we need to be dealing with this stuff here. If America is truly the daughter of Babylon, folks, we have a major issue to deal with here. How are you going to deal with it? And and we can sit here and and speculate and talk and everything. Or we can do something about it. Me and my family, hey, we did something about it. I believe in this. Like, I believe the Bible. I took faith in it, and I beat feet down here. And mm-hmm. and so these are things we need to stop talking, and we need to start having action, just like what Joe said. Joe, I totally <laughs> dug your Laodicean stuff, man. That lit me on fire. Mm-hmm. So this, 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 and I'm sorry to, to, to kind of squash the idea, Doug, but when we make this an issue, we, we open up a can of worms when we as trying to educate people don't need to be opening. And and the way that I always do it, I just slam it shut. Do you got the crystal ball? Yes or no? If you don't, then be quiet. Sit down. So, I love it. <laughs> well, we may, we, we may that answer? on how you're wording it, but I think we agree on the same impact that, you know, that the focus should not be on debating the timing of the rapture, the emphasis should be on, you know, I think we have to assume that the rapture, you know, doesn't happen before the tribulation. Now, it might, but let's assume that it doesn't. What are we going to do about it? And, of course, it opens up, we're almost at the top of the hour, it opens up this question of, all right, so let's assume that we're right, that America is the daughter of Babylon, that America is going to be destroyed as the Bible as the Bible teaches. Then the question is, well, when does that happen, and then what are we going to do about it? Mm, mm. Sounds like the third hour. <laughs> very, very good. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I love working. We love working with you guys, man. You guys are like a finely tuned machine all together. Uh, this, by the way, folks, is the first time we've had five, count them, five people uh, guests on our program in a panel format in this fashion. And to talk about, and Ray, I've got to commend you for bringing up the rapture, um, uh, you know, uh, and, and handling it that way, because I do believe, and I'll just toss this out there and anyone can pick this up. Go ahead, Joe. Go no, ahead. I just wanted to say that, um, you know, 
with all we see what with the the rapture uh, debate causes, and it the seems like there yeah. are right. And until you know we can, uh, you know, are more mature in our spiritual journey, until people can, uh, until brothers in Christ can talk about this issue and not tear each other down. Uh, then, you know, once that time comes, then we can talk about it and get into it. But it's not a salvation-bearing issue. Of course, who wouldn't want to be taken away from uh, yeah, you know, the tribulation and, and the, the, you know, persecution that's going to come upon the church? Uh, you know, uh, who, who wouldn't want to be to be able to escape from that? So I, I agree with what Ray says, you know. Uh, you know, you hope to be taken. Uh, you hope that the rapture is true, but you prepare in your mind and in your spirit that you have to endure. And I well, think that's, you know, Brothers, thing. So everybody uh, that is uh, very much into the rapture and in, in this way usually quotes the key rapture verse is uh, Revelation 3.10. I've kept the news of church in Philadelphia from the hour of, of testing, the trial, which is to try all them uh, that dwell on the earth. Now, it is true that we are kept from that ultimate judgment, and that will fall on all them that dwell on the earth. These are the earth dwellers. That phrase, dwell on the earth, they're the ones that persecute the two witnesses. They're the, they are the ones who are allied with the beast. And as Ray Stedman says, these are the folks who have their fingers in the dirt of the earth. Okay, they have made their chief occupation the things of this earth, this world, juxtaposed to the one that Satan blasphemes in Revelation 13, all them who tabernacle in heaven. Now, what Ray brings out is that obviously he's persecuting the saints there, whether you consider them Christians or uh, tribulation saints or whatever, but the fact of the matter is that they're on the earth while this persecution is going on. You can see it in the context, but they tabernacle in heaven. In other words, they have a heavenly mindset juxtaposed to the dwellers on the earth. So we're kept from that trial. Now, it's interesting that the church in Smyrna, nothing negative was said about that church either, only two churches, Philadelphia and Smyrna. Now, Smyrna says that Satan, the devil, is going to throw you into prison for 10 days. Well, some have interpreted, interpreted that to mean, you know, the 10 persecutions of the Roman Empire. Others have said, no, that 10 days is a literal time that happened to them. And others say, well, 10 is connected in the Revelation as one-tenth of the city is destroyed, the 10 crowns, the 10 heads, the ten horns, it's connected to the Antichrist. Therefore, it is Satan, the devil, who is persecuting the church in Smyrna. And so he prepares them for tribulation. They get the crown of life. This is the church in Smyrna. Praise God for the church in Smyrna. And praise God for the church in Philadelphia. Okay? In other words, you can look at both of those, 2.10 and 3.10, in the Revelation, and we are all, in that sense, pre wrath None of us that are, that are truly living for the Lord are going to be going through any of the wrath of the Lamb. And, and, and so I look forward to the fact that, the, that whatever tribulation that we go through, I mean, good night, brothers. There are saints all over the Middle East who are being beheaded, who are being slain for the faith of Jesus right now as we speak. And so they're already in the tribulation, right? And I think Ray's yeah. right in the sense that, hey, what should we be emphasizing? Hey, John, you're on the Isle of Patmos. What are you doing there? I got here for two reasons, of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this is what I'm here for. We need to stress the word of God and the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the spirit of prophecy. This is not a brain trip. We're not just here contemplating a grapevine. We are in here speaking to these things. And like Ray said, we're taking action by the grace of God. We need to take action. We need to strategize. We need to sit here and, and discuss these matters openly 
and in a public way and put it all on the table. That's what the prophecy forum is trying to do here. We're trying to put it all on the table. We know we got all these different views, but hey, we accept everybody that sees that the kingdom is yet to come and that's coming soon and Jesus Christ is coming back literally and in person and we've got to get ready for this. We need to prepare ourselves. We need to walk in the Spirit. We need to fill our lamps with oil and we need to invest our talents because the Master's coming back and he wants to cash in on what we've done with our talents. Amen. Exciting word. Absolutely. Uh, g- gentlemen, yeah. we are at the top of the hour. Gentlemen, we're at the top of the hour. We're going to have to ask you to hold your thoughts. I just want to thank each and every one of you for your input uh, and the passion which all five of you have, uh, true men of God, and I just cannot wait. And I know Joe is the same way. We both uh, cannot wait to, to meet with you, to fellowship with you at, uh, at the conference in Columbus, the Prophecy uh, Forum conference in Columbus. Folks, go to hagmanandhagman.com, click on the graphic on the left hand side uh you've got really literally hours to register uh, i mean we're talking we're down to the wire so if you haven't made a decision and i can't understand why you wouldn't have please please do so tonight and uh, uh commit to attending the prophecy the the conference in columbus dublin to be precise in ohio folks we're talking with mr ray gann a prof- uh, prophecy.com Doug Woodward Faith Happens Faith Hyphen Happens dot com Doug Krieger Dean McGriff The Tribulation Network John Price author and uh, fa- just a fabulous author I've got his book right here in front of me The End of America and I, I got to tell you folks uh, compelling arguments it's just fantastic I, I just cannot and say we're going to have the privilege of uh, being in the same room with some of these gentlemen tomorrow and I'm looking forward to that. Well after hearing yeah. after hearing what we were heard tonight, I'm not sure we are we should be in the shadows of these men. Um I'm not sure. uh, seriously, you, we're talking some heavy heavy duty stuff here and and uh these five uh, men of men of God are are just uh in my view uh really the cream of the crop. So folks, you're listening to a very special edition of the Hagman Report Hagman and Hagman Report. It's the 12th day of November 2014. I'm Doug Hagman with stu- with my son Joe Hagman in studio. We're going to be right back after this brief. Ladies and gentlemen, to our third and final hour on this Wednesday, November 12th, 2014. We are going to be in Dublin, Ohio, uh, leaving tomorrow. Sheila will be here uh, guest hosting, uh, filling in for us. She does a great job with the weekend show, and she has a great show lined up for tomorrow. John Ramirez, a popular, sought-out public speaker, both uh, Christian and for Christian and secular events, has been a featured guest on hundreds of TVs and radio programs, including the 700 Club, formerly a ranking high priest of a satanic cult in New York City, John is now a vibrant evangelist who loves to share the gospel of Jesus wherever he goes, as John did formerly thousands of years ago, are now finding their way out of uh, Satanism. Uh, I hope I pronounce this right. Paolo Mayobi and spiritualism, as he shares his fascinating and powerful story with them. His remarkable story is told in the book Out of the Devil's Cauldron, A Journey from Darkness to Light. This intriguing story walks you through the dark alleys of the uh, satiric cult. I'm sorry, Sheila. While exposing hidden secrets of darkness. Don't miss tomorrow's show. It's going to be fantastic um, as she has um, these guests lined up. And they, uh, once again, John Ramirez and Paolo Memboye. And um, the book uh, of the latter guest is Out of the Devil's Cauldron. And... um, as always, her shows are fantastic, so we want to thank Sheila for filling in for us. And uh, we will be live tomorrow, but she will be the one uh, at the She's going to be taking over for us, and we want to thank you. Right now, we've got Ray Gano, Doug Woodward, Doug Krieger, two, uh, three Dougs tonight, um, Dean McGriff, and John Price. Uh, gentlemen, who wants to take it coming out of the gate now? Um, Doug, this is John Price. Let me just jump in at the beginning and say a couple quick things about timing. Um, a few years ago, we were in a, a church, and an attorney in town came to me, and he said that he was considering joining our church. And I said, oh, it would be great. And so about a week later, he called me, and he had uh, been asked to come in and, and have an interview with the Board of Elders. And he said, John, what kind of church do you have? And I said, well, I think it's pretty good, you know, standard old sort of Baptist church. And he said, well, 
he said, I went in there and we were talking and, and somehow he said, I don't even know how it came to it, but the subject came up of what I believed about whether the rapture was pre, mid, or post-trip. And he, he said, I actually sort of think it's probably towards the end and maybe before God's wrath. And he said, everything got real cold in the room. And I was told that because of my view on the timing of prophecy, I couldn't become a member of your church. I use that as an illustration for the point that a couple of you made earlier, and that is that what we're about to talk about in this next hour shouldn't separate fellowship, shouldn't cause people to be really upset with each other, because none of us uh, have a 100% crystal ball, as uh, Ray just pointed out. And so what we're going to talk about from a timing viewpoint uh, is, in, is important. But one issue I'd like to make about timing that I also think is relevant, and that is, I read it this a couple of days ago. It's better to be five years early than five minutes too late. Amen. Um, so let me just mention on the question of timing. If a person were to say, hey, I think there's no question that America, that country that we love so much, is the daughter of Babylon, mystery Babylon, no question about it, then they have a couple of decisions to make. Once they make the decision that it is, then they have to look at the 10 different verses that are both Old and New Testament that say to Christians and to Jewish residents of that great end times country to flee, verses like flee out of Babylon, let everyone flee, flee from Babylon, run for your lives, come out of her, my people, etc. You can read them there, 10 of them. Um, at that point in time, the question comes down, okay, fine, that's good, I think I should, but when? Now, there's a verse that I'd like to talk about with all of these experts here for just a minute, and it's from Jeremiah 51, it's two verses, 51, 45, and 46. Let me just read both of them quickly. Come out of her, my people, run for your lives, run from the fierce anger of the Lord, do not lose heart or be afraid when rumors are heard in the land, one rumor comes this year, another the next, rumors of violence in the land and of ruler against ruler. Uh, and I should say in regard to these two verses that there are other verses that say specifically that there will be violence in the land, including blood in the church, strangers in the sanctuary, and that sort of thing before the country comes to its end. The reason I bring up these two from Jeremiah 51, 45, and 46 is there's an implication in here that there might be a one-year warning period of some sort, or that when things get really bad, there may be one more year when it says rumor comes this year and another next. So that's that's one thought just to, to talk about. Okay. And 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 the, the second thing is that once Israel is betrayed, we talked about that earlier, mm -hmm. I, I don't really believe that, that a sound mind person would say, I'm going to wait until I pick up the newspaper and see that the United States betrays Israel, because I think there's good reason to believe from Scripture that the U.S. is destroyed in one day, one hour, and one moment immediately upon betraying Israel. Because mm -hmm. Proverbs 22, 3 says, a prudent man sees the danger and takes refuge, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. So if a person's trying to game the, the exit date by saying, well, I'm going to wait until after we betray Israel, I think that might be way too late. So those are my timing thoughts. Um, on John and I have talked a lot about this, and one of the things that we see is, and we, I, I'm a big history person, but in Nazi Germany, the people, you know, there were people who saw the reading and writing on the wall, and they, they saw that the Nazis were coming to power. What they did is they got out of Dodge before that time. That was phase one. Phase two is when Nazis finally started taking over and started having more power and everything like that. They, then phase two happened. People were only able to escape with the clothes on the back and the suitcases that they could carry. Phase one, they were able to take their furniture, their money, all their stuff, make decisions, do great. And then finally there's phase three. And phase three people are going to be running with the clothes on their backs as they're being hunted. And and this is something that people people need to understand. This is why I I, I kind of you know look I don't want to say look down or or anything like that on on 
on what I and, and again, this isn't frivolous information either. I, if America truly is the daughter of Babylon, then you know we need to be taking action. Um, I mean, to, to I'll be the first one to throw out a date. Um, I wrote a book a couple years ago called Israel, America, and God's Judgment. And in that, I look at the historical background uh, of America versus Israel and what took place. And, and I believe God has a way of judging nations, and, and he, de- he takes steps. Well, one of the things, and this is something that even Jonathan Kahn has, has written on uh, just recently, but the sabbatical year. And like it or not, every every sabbatical year that we've had, major things have taken place. Yeah. And and if we are following in the same footsteps and everything, and and again, just to check it out, look up England from 1550 to 1660. 60, yeah, and look at the England did the same thing. God judged England, and it's amazing to look at some of these nations. Anyways. Um, I honestly think 2015, September 2015, October 2015, is, is going to be a critical time date. Uh, it's going to be the end of the, of, the, of the sabbatical year, which we are in right now. And every time that date comes, then bad things happen. And, and America has done all the stuff that Israel did when Israel was rebelling against God. The final thing that has not happened to America is, is basically being captured or, or um, what is the word that I'm looking for, held captive. They were, they were held captive by Babylon. They took many of them to Babylon with them. Uh, and, and I honestly believe that we might see some sort of maybe invasion or something. Uh, read Isaiah 5, the last portion of Isaiah 5, the first part of I mean, the, where God judges the nations. They're like the seven woes. Well, America has committed those seven woes. And if you read at the final end of, of Isaiah 5, it talks about how God releases these enemies, and they come in like a roaring lion. They, they will not sleep. They, they're just they're, they're utterly ruthless and everything. And, and these are things that are happening. And so I honestly believe that when this sabbatical thing happens, that we may see something take place, October uh, or September 2015. And then uh, Doug Krieger mentioned uh, around 2018, same thing. That's the end of the, I, I believe it's the end of the generation. Uh, when you run the math and, and everything, now what happens at the end of the generation, who knows? We don't know. It just might be the end of the generation. But uh, I, I see things happening here, and and what we need to focus on as teachers is kind of get away from the superfluous stuff. It's all fun and everything like that. But if it's truly America is the daughter of Babylon, then we need to really start thinking about how we're going to deal with this. How are we going to prepare? How are we going to, to handle this? And, and something that, that I share a lot with people is in Isaiah 6, uh, some of my favorite verses, but Isaiah 6, 8 says, Also I heard a voice from the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said, Here, here am I, send me. That was Isaiah's commission. And Isaiah said, Hey, send me, I'm here. Amen. But if you interesting, at the, in the end of, of uh, Isaiah 6, it also shows that in Isaiah uh, 12, I mean, it's Isaiah 6, 12, and 13, is the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaken in the midst of the land, but in it ye shall a tent, and it shall return. And, and I honestly believe that God is sending people out of America for, because, so that we can be maybe the tent that will return and help recede. I think, you know, things are going to go bad. Now, I know some of you think that America's going to be completely wiped off the face of the earth and everything like that. I don't, I just, I can't see that. Historically, again, I'm a history person. So historically, I can't see an entire nation like that to be completely wiped off. The only, the only example of that is Sodom and Gomorrah that we have, historically mm-hmm. speaking. Um, but I think that our nation will be greatly destroyed, greatly impacted in everything. And it's going to be up to people like us who see this to educate the people and help them understand and, and then have a plan, start doing something about it instead of worrying about all this other supplorative stuff that tickles the ears. Okay, I'm done preaching. It's <laughs> <laughs> Jack Woodward. Let me, I'm going to turn it over and ask that Krieger to start talking and Dean McGriff because they've, they've done a lot of thinking about this. But 
just to make the comment first off that I think you guys have framed the question really, really well. Um, and, you know, John Price, I've read your book again just recently, and I think you do a great job of arguing uh, compellingly for why, um, you know, you should, you know, why Christians should flee Babylon. Now, I, I think there is a different, uh, another point of view, and I think it, to some extent, it depends upon the timing of the the events, uh, you know, in the tribulation period and what happens after or at the end of Daniel's 70th week. But uh, first off, just to say, I think you guys, have, Ray and, and John, you framed the issue. Clearly, you've taken a position, and, uh, you know, and that's, I think that's fantastic. You're acting out of your convictions, and, and uh, amen. Good. Dean McGrath, Dean McGrath, you guys should jump in here, and I'll, I'll lay back. Why don't you say something, Dean? I think you got something to say. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I, if, you, if you look at, you know, Revelation 16 is the wrath of God, right? I think we'd all agree with that, because it's the final bowl of judgment being poured out. And then it explains what the three parts are that Doug mentioned earlier of Babylon that are being judged. So <clears throat> first of all, I look at that, and, and we get to Revelation 18, and it says, get out of Babylon, you know, unless you participate in the plagues and so forth. We know that. But I see that as a very, very end-time event, and all the world is sitting there weeping because it's been destroyed, and uh, all the world has gotten rich with her, trading with her, and they've traded by oceans and so forth. And we go into all of this in our in our book. <clears throat> but um, you know, to to us, if America is the final battle, and it has a very important role to play, clear to the end. And you know, role number one is <clears throat> it it uh, signs the Treaty of Hell and Death in Daniel nine twenty seven with Israel and then betrays Israel at the end of three and a half years. And it, it's still trucking through that whole time. I mean, it's doing its conquest thing we see in Isaiah and and so forth throughout, uh, clear up to the very end. And then it's judged. But <clears throat> to us, the most important thing is, uh, you know, we were talking about the rapture earlier. The most important thing isn't the rapture. I could care less. I don't even talk about it because to us, the most important thing about the last days is witness and testimony. <clears throat> and, you know, God has two peoples, and Doug, of course, is going to be talking about this at the end of the week because he's got a great book, and we've been talking about this for over 25 years, 30 years and that is this issue of, of the two witnesses, and I'll let Doug go into that because he wrote the book. But, <clears throat> you know, it, it, it's more about being pro-testimony because this is what we see as happening nowadays uh, all over in the Middle East. These Christians are standing up. Uh, they're coming to the Lord in their deathbed. The Muslims are. They're, they're, they're turning to the Lord in droves. And there's a, a tremendous testimony that's sweeping the earth. And always, out of, out of plenty and out of the good times, the church just dies on the vine. But the minute you touch the church and there's persecution, it shines so incredibly brightly. So to us, I, uh, Doug Woodward and I had discussions about this, and and, uh, and and you know I I likened it to the uh, <clears throat> it's it's not pro choice it's it's pro life pro death and and it's not you know rapture whenever but it's it's against against testimony or pro testimony I mean to us we mm. see this as the church's finest hour it's Israel's finest hour God is using His peoples to stand up and to show who God is what He is. And, and and it's a testimony to the whole earth. And then you know here we are, and 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 the, the, there you see them in heaven. They're standing before the throne, and they're saying, "How much longer is this going to go on?" <laughs> well, just a little bit. And then you get to Revelation 20, and and you see those who didn't take the mark, who didn't worship the beast, and so forth, are are going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And those that were beheaded, so the headectomy, you know. Guaranteed, they're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. That means there's a lot of saints on the earth that are losing their heads during the tribulation. And, you know, like someone said at the very beginning, 
you know, these are the most exciting times the world has ever seen. You know, to be here when Jesus came the first time, that was cool. But, you know, to be here when he comes back, if we make it that far, or we'll just be before the throne praying through everything. But, you know, it, it's the most exciting period, and it's all, to Doug and I, it's all about testimony. Uh, and, and believe me, if the Lord says, you know, go to Latin America, I'd, I'd be the first one going. <laughs> you know, but to but me, it doesn't really matter. Right at this point in time, and, and it may, and there may become a time, you know, when it says, well, if you want to be here to testify, then you maybe better leave, because it's going to get tough. You know, it's going to get tough. I thought Tom Horn's book didn't go quite far enough, because there will be civil war within the church. You know, we, we see the church is just falling by the wayside, and, and we see something coming. So we read the end of the book. We know what's happening. It's going to be glorious, but... To us, it's all about testimony and his peoples. That's the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's his church. That's his body that fills all in us. And there, there it is, right on the earth. And uh, it's going to be glorious. It's going to be absolutely fabulous. Hmm. Uh, wow. Doug, Very good. Doug, what, Go ahead, sir. I'll make a comment. Um, I'll make a comment here just to clarify. Uh, it's why the you know John uh, John Price um, John correct me if I'm wrong but your argument is that the uh, destruction of America uh, will happen through a you know probably through Muslim terrorists and it will likely happen prior to Daniel's 70th week uh, what we call the tribulation period um, and it will uh, it will make sort of make way for an antichrist to appear in Europe, uh, who is Muslim. Now, you may have changed your view, I don't know, but, but uh, that's my understanding from reading your book. And, and whereas we take the, we believe the timing of the destruction of America is late in the tribulation period, and so, uh, you know, we may see the, the tribulation uh, happening before uh, the destruction of America. So, uh, and that makes a big difference, I think, in terms of, of whether one decides that they, they should leave or flee of Babylon, uh, you know, prior to Daniel's 70th week or sometime during it, if, uh, you know, if they still have, if we still have the opportunity. Maybe I could, maybe I could uh, amplify this a little bit more, uh, what we're trying to say here, because in, in a way, in a very real way, what uh, uh, Ray and John are saying uh, we can concur with that. I can concur with that in the sense that when you look at the return of of, uh, of the captivity of Israel, of the Jews, to Babylon, and uh, Daniel's prayer uh, that led up to ultimately their release uh, from uh, Babylon was, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it took place in a very intriguing fashion. It wasn't until Cyrus, the Persian king, that the first decrees are made where they could actually return. It was a very graduated return. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, obviously not all of them returned uh, to, uh, and if you would, they were legitimately freed. It wasn't so much a fleeing, for sure, uh, but they were held captive and then they were released. Now, several things here. One is, Daniel never did leave Babylon. He never did leave. But he was there when Babylon went down, and he read the handwriting on the wall. Now, my, I have a little math background, and so when I read the, the, the phraseology that's mentioned there, it's monetary terminology, mina, mina. This is the handwriting on the wall when King uh, Belshazzar had his big 1,000-plate dinner and everybody was having a blast in there, and then the handwriting, you know, we all heard about the handwriting on the wall. Well, it was Mina Mina Tekel Uparsen, and uh, we all know that the, the kingdom had uh, been judged and uh, uh, taken from him and divided that very night. He was weighed in the balance and found wanting, and those are monetary terms. A Mina is a thousand, a Mina Mina is two thousand, a Tekel is uh, twenty shekels, and uparsin is when you parse words, it's the parsing of a mina is 500. 2,000 
of uh, 520, 2,520. And so what you have here is, is uh, a, a fractal of what we call the sacred cubit. The Hebrew sacred cubit is 25.20 inches, and uh, you'd probably have to get my book on the, um, the Hebrew sacred cubit. Now, some people, like uh, my beloved brother Doug Hamp, believes that it's the uh, Egyptian royal cubit, uh, but, uh, you know, 21.181818. But there are 2,520 days in the 70th week of Daniel, 2520, broken down into two halves, 1260, 1260. Oh, oh. So it comes out to 2520. Oh. Now, what I'm saying here is this. In Revelation 18 and verse 4, when it says, Come up out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins and her plagues, she's obviously going to be judged. Now, I don't believe that when Israel was delivered from Egypt, that they did that on their own accord. In other words, the hand of Almighty God with a strong arm brought the children of Israel out of Pharaoh and even hardened Pharaoh's heart. And those ten plagues, there's that number ten again, that they were uh, brought out by the Almighty. They couldn't deliver themselves. In a very real way, uh, the captivity uh, they couldn't deliver themselves. God decreed that they be free. They couldn't deliver themselves. And so when we get to Revelation 18.4, there is a sense there. Is that actually, I mean, I've looked at it uh, for some time, that may, be, that may even be a rapture verse. I mean, I may be going way out on the line in saying that. In other words, God says, all right, I'm judging Babylon. Come up out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins and plague, because I'm coming down on Babylon. Now, that's not to say, having said all of that, you know, I, I'm telling Ray and John right now, keep the light on. <laughs> you never know when we're going to come come down. <laughs> <to join you. laughs> I'm not kidding you. I'm 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 just saying that uh, there's enough fluidity in here that I look at this and I see these two prophets that are standing in the street of the great city when they are actually persecuted in open persecution for a very interesting time frame of 3.5 days which is the same time frame that Jesus had when he went into Jerusalem before they crucified him. And they even say where our Lord was crucified. Now, they're standing in the street of the great city, and that great city is no friend of the holy city because the court of the Gentiles is determined to tread the holy city underfoot for the same time frame of 42 months that the beast is waging war against the saints. Now, the court of the Gentiles that plans to tread us under the holy city is a place that was on the Temple Mount made for Gentiles or made for people who really wanted and wanted to offer their sacrifice at the altar. But when he said measure the temple, measure the altar... And those that are worshiping at the altar but don't me measure the court which has been given to the Gentiles, the court of the Gentiles, because they're going to tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. I'm leading up to something here, brothers, and that's this. The ones who could not offer the sacrifice were uncircumcised. They met the priest at the door, and the guy had asked the guy, are you circumcised? And he would have to say, no, I'm not. Well, you're not going to offer your bullock. I don't care how much money you have. You're not coming in here. You're uncircumcised. And it's going to be that group that never dealt with their flesh or never had their flesh dealt with that are going to persecute the holy city for 42 months. Now, let's get the metaphor down. The compromisers, the blood on the altar that Tom Horn tried to put together did a pretty good job on it. And the fact of the matter is, is this. The ones who are into betrayal, the ones who are going to go after God's people, unfortunately, brethren, are the ones who are professing but not possessing the Spirit of Christ. 
They're the ones who never dealt with their flesh. They can't be measured at the altar. Yep. They are going to tread the holy city along with the beast for those 42 months. Yep, yep, yep. I, I, do, do you see what I'm saying here? And so, I mean, don't have any illusions to the contrary. I, I'm saying this. There is going, judgment is going to fall on this place. Now, that very interesting verse that we always quote in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, and that has to do that they that are alive, and the word we use is remain, but the word in the Greek is much stronger. It means to survive. They that are alive and survive. Now, I think that what may be happening is God is preparing some people who are like a, a, a precursor uh, to the survival and to the and to the thriving uh, outside of Babylon. The re, you know they're they're being delivered from Babylon and a remnant a very physical way, and and uh, so we're all together in this. <laughs> okay, Doug, can I can I jump in for a second? Yeah. Let's come back to the question of who will be the destructive force against the daughter of Babylon, because we can deal with that pretty quickly. Mm. Uh, Jeremiah tells us mm. uh, in Jeremiah 51, 27, and 28, and it's basically two groups. Um, the first one is he stirs up the kings of the Medes. That's what he says. Yeah. The Lord has stirred up the kings of the Medes. And, of course, we know that's Persia, Iran. Uh, actually, the Medes were in part of what's Iraq today, which is interesting since ISIS is in Iraq. And the second part is that he stirs up, um, he says, summon against her these kingdoms, Ararat, Mani, and Eskenaz, which are in areas which included part of Armenia, which was used to be part of the Soviet Union, yeah. uh, includes a little bit of Turkey and Iran and so forth. So we know that basically what the, the countries that God will use to stir up and destroy the daughter of Babylon, <laughs> time to feed the dog. Um, <laughs> Hey, there's still no more dogs in the New Jerusalem. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, I don't know where the dogs are. But dog. in any case, these two different um, geographical areas are described, and they include what we would call today Iran and Iraq and um, the Soviet Union, which is fascinating when you look at the fact that the United States is currently involved in what many have described as what will be a, a capitulation in the agreement with Iran concerning their ability to acquire nuclear weapons. Yes. When you think about the fact that in Scripture it says that that will be the very area that God will allow to be used to destroy the daughter of Babylon. Uh, final uh, point I'd like to make about leaving, fleeing. Um, I think, this is a pure guess on my part, but I think that one of the reasons why God is going to allow strangers in the sanctuary and violence in the streets, and blood in the church, these are three prophecies given concerning the daughter of Babylon, are incentives to flee. I mean, let's, let's face it, right now, there are some people who see the scriptures and flee. I have a neighbor up the road here who read the verse that Doug just read a minute ago about fleeing and avoiding the plagues and avoiding the sins, and he moved here 14 years ago. I mean, he, he got it a long time ago. There'll be others who will be in the future looking at it and getting it. But if your pastor gets, gets arrested or worse yet, shot in the pulpit because he refuses to, to preach a same-sex marriage message or worse yet, he preaches a traditional Bible message on marriage, which pretty soon, once the Supreme Court uh, rules on the latest SSM case, um, it, it'll be even more unacceptable in the daughter of Babylon. If these things begin to happen in a accelerated basis and more violence in the streets uh, the parents of this young man who was shot in Missouri they just announced tonight are going to go to the United Nations and testify and ask for help from the United Nations um, right you can see where that's headed so violence blood um, pastors arrested and or shot and so forth that's going to cause people who may be withering or trying to decide whether they want to leave to say you know what Elma I think it's time Mm. To to dovetail off of, of John here a second, real quickly, I, I was talking about Isaiah 5, and if you read the second half of Isaiah 5, and if you have the Thompson Chain Bible, there's a little section here, a little title that says, 
God judges the nations or how God judges the nations. Mm-hmm. And to, to, to reflect on what John was saying, if you go down to chapter 5, 26, and it says, And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. And behold, they shall come speed swiftly. None shall be weary. None shall stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep. Neither shall they gird their loins be loosed, nor their latch of their shoes be broken, whose arrows are sharp and their bows bent. Their horses shall be uh, counted like flint and their heels the wheels like a whirlwind, their roaring shall be like a, ro- like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and they shall lay hold prey. They shall carry it away, Satan, none shall deliver it. And in that day they shall roar against like them like a roaring sea. Uh, and again, this is the chapter that, that clearly where God says how he judges his nations. Now this is how he judged, I believe, Judah. Um, but God judges nations. But this is clearly, when I read this, I mean, I'm sorry, but I have no. I'm not. I. This is stinking Muslims coming to evade America, and and again, if you if you look back at at England, the same thing happened to them. They were severely invaded, and that's what brought them down. And and then the final thing that destroyed England was the Great London Fire. So we we. What I'm pointing out is that we see a pattern on at least how God judges nations and how things happen. And and even if we take a lot of this, maybe even out of the Bible prophecy arena, in a sense, with tribulation and, and, and everything like that, and I know that I'm kind of going out on a limb on that one, but no matter what, America is really messed up right now, and God is not going to be sitting around much longer twiddling his thumbs and say, okay, America, you can go ahead and kill more babies and have gay marriage and all this other garbage that America is doing. I mean, who was it? It was... Uh, Billy Graham's wife, Ruth Graham, that said, hey, listen, you know, if, if God judged America, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah like the way he did, you know, if America keeps on continuing, then, you know, he's going to have to apologize to them. And, and so this is what's happening. Well, how about Cheryl Atkinson and, and Rick Wild, both of whom have either been surveilled or had their computers broken into? Oh, yeah. And I, I mean, these are not good signs when... Uh, people in an official position are surveilling and interfering and attempting to intimidate people in the news media. Mm. That's for sure. Well, well let me, the, let me the, pose the a question. Of course. If, if I can, just interrupt. Uh, this is yeah. Doug Hagman. Um, if I can just interrupt one thing, and uh, in fact, uh, each one of you can just, uh, if you feel so compelled, to uh, answer this briefly. But uh, my, my uh, position is this: uh, I have, well, personally, I have not received any type of instruction, and I've been certainly asking, you know, what my place, what our place would be in these end times, and I certainly have not been told to flee, move, or otherwise uh, do anything except what we're doing. Now, having said that, would will God's judgment, do you believe, and this is to each one of you, do you believe that God's judgment will be um, th- those who are righteous in the spirit and in, in action and uh, you know, uh, fighting the battle behind enemy lines, so to speak. Uh, Will we be protected uh, from the judgment of God? I suppose I could ask that in five different ways, but that's the gist of my question. And I guess I could, let me just pose that to Ray Gano first, and then we'll go down the the list. Yes, I do believe it, uh, because we're promised a remnant. I do see a remnant, and, and I want, you know, I see myself as a remnant. I mean, I don't know if God's going to bring me back to America or anything, but maybe my family might move here, and then eventually my family might go back and, and, and help. But, yeah, God always leaves a remnant, and and it's going to be hardcore Bible-believing Christians that are going to make the stand, and it's going to be tough. I mean, it's going to be tough here, too. This isn't going to be sure. a gravy train walk. It's going to be tough. But, yeah, yes. All right, Mr. Wood- Mr. Woodward, can you comment on that? Yeah, um, certainly I, my sense is that, uh, you know, judgment has already been happening in America pretty much. Um, you know, the, the books we talked about are mentioned earlier uh, just briefly, but uh, Bill Cummings' book, Eye to Eye, Jonathan Kahn's book, The Harbinger, uh, David Brennan wrote a book called The Israel Omen. Um, let's see, who am I leaving out? Um, 
there's there been a number of books that have talked about the you know the judgment that's come against America because America has already been betraying Israel and uh, demanding Israel give up land for peace. So we've already been seeing that. And then, uh, as Ray pointed out, um, the Shemitah year. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's very probable that in the fall something dramatic will happen economically in America. That has been the pattern in 2001, 2008, so yep. 2015. Yeah, I think it's very, very probable, and certainly uh, what Jonathan Kahn is is predicting in his latest book. So I think that's uh, that's very, very, very probable as well. So uh, I think that judgment is uh, greater. Judgment is coming. Judgment has already been happening. Um, you know, we would be very foolish if we were not indicating to uh, to our fellow Americans that. You know, judgment is coming on this nation. God is is, uh, is is judging our country for its failures in so many ways, uh, and it will culminate, uh, you know, in the uh, as as it betrays Israel, uh, and we believe that will happen sometime uh, right around the midpoint of the tribulation. There is, uh, you know, judgment will be coming very soon thereafter, uh, even in greater. Uh, you know, to a greater extent. So um, we we need okay. to be preaching that message right right away. All right, uh, Mr. Krieger, uh, protection over the yeah. soldiers of Christ behind the behind the battle lines. Your comment behind the battle lines. Well, my comment on that, brother, is straight, pretty straightforward. Uh, the themes that are reoccurring in the Revelation and in Daniel and throughout the prophets, are, are, are pretty much this way. There is the prophesying of God's people. There is the persecution of God's people. There is the uh, perseverance of God's people. And there is the preservation of God's people. Uh, so we, we, we see what looks as if is, uh, you know, some are, are directly laying down their lives for the Lamb of God. There are others who uh, will be preserved. Uh, the interesting thing is, is that the martyrs that are crying out from beneath the fifth seal altar. How long before you avenge our blood? And he basically says, uh, you're going to have to wait a little while until the number of the, number of the martyrs is complete huh. before there is any vengeance that is meted out upon them that dwell on the earth uh, that have caused this suffering and this martyrdom. Uh, so... Uh, so you 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 it, it's not uh, it's not an all or nothing thing in the sense that there's going to be miraculous preservation. Uh, the, uh, truly, the sealing of Israel uh, uh, in chapter seven of the twelve tribes, representative of the twelve tribes, 144,000, is a is obviously a, a divine intervention, a miraculous uh, saving. Of of uh, of the Jews to greet Messiah upon His coming. Again, you will not see My face until you say, "Blessed is He that comes in the name of the Lord." Hosanna. So you 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 have these contrasts that are just there. Uh, they that stay behind might be more akin to a Corey Tin Boom, where you know she protected the Jews, knowing that it would cause her a possible uh, incarceration in a concentration camp, which it did her whole family. And uh, she and, and, yeah. and uh, I think just a couple of her family survived. But there is that, there is that element. Uh, and uh, I think that um, if this is not a faith uh, worth dying for, it certainly isn't one worth living for. Uh, I think that uh, Elizabeth Elliot, uh, Jim Elliot's wife, nailed it. Uh, she said very clearly, you know, Jim gave his life because he believed that this faith was worth dying for, if need be. But we don't need to be foolish about that 
we need we need to hear the voice of God and what He's speaking uh, to the churches and to, to us within the church. It is a matter of testimony. It is the testimony of Jesus Christ, and uh, that may uh, constitute being paid with our lives. That may definitely be uh, they that are alive and uh, survive uh, whatever is going to come upon the face of the earth, whether it's before the so-called tribulation or during the tribulation or whatever. Uh, seemingly at that point, uh, you know, time frame-wise, doesn't make too much difference. We're going to be uh, uh, enduring to the end regardless, <laughs> wherever that end is, right? Wherever you are geographically, right. Okay, let me ask uh, Dean McGriff the same question and then followed by John Price. Uh, Dean? I pretty much said it all before. You know, I mean, I, I, okay. I see this, you know, going all the way through to the very end, and uh, some will be martyred, some won't, some will survive to the end, um, some won't. But um, there is certainly a seal for the believer, you know, okay. that talks about, and, and we may be miraculously uh, taken care of. Actually, um, the reason I'm asking this, uh, uh, gentlemen, is uh, I, I've probably got, and this is no exaggeration, perhaps six six dozen emails asking about, uh, uh, you know, will there be divine protection behind enemy lines, uh, or will there just be mass, you know, uh, the destruction? And, and of course, those, you know, there's, it's really a hot button topic second only perhaps to the timing of the rapture uh so okay, okay. um uh, J- john price what yes. do you, what um, say you? i think in many ways we we need to see that it's a lot like jeremiah's uh, words to the people in judah in which he specifically told them that if they didn't obey what god said to do in regard to fleeing yeah. that they would pay for it with their lives. And, and later in Jeremiah, you read that actually there was a total destruction. So instead of me giving my views, let me just quote three quick verses. Jeremiah 51, 6. Flee from Babylon, run for your lives, do not be destroyed because of her sins. Um, Psalm 137, 8, referring to the daughter of Babylon. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is he who repays you for what you have done to us, which is a reference to the betrayal of Israel. And then lastly, Jeremiah 50, 32, I will kindle a fire in her towns, that's plural, that will consume all who are around her. So um, I would love to be able to say, well, I think that there will be a remnant, but I just don't see it in the verses. Maybe, maybe there will be. But there was a congressional study that said that if there's a major event uh, of a nuclear nature, even a EMP type event, that within one year, 90% of the people in the country would perish because they won't have electricity, which means they won't have food, which means that the sewage systems don't work, they don't, won't be able to drive their cars, etc. It's not a pleasant picture, um, but of course, when Jeremiah was speaking to, to Judah, he, would, he said this is not a pleasant picture, but you need to know what's coming. God loves us so much that he's given us these warnings um, and I think, in, in, as I said a moment ago, he also loves us so much that he knows we're a little bit hard-headed and we don't want to leave a comfortable environment. We don't want to leave the what I hear all the time described as the most exceptional, greatest nation in the world, and in many ways we are, um, but in many ways we're the, the mother of abominations. So I think we have to see the country as God sees it, not the way Hollywood sees it. So bottom line, If God has laid upon your heart that America is the daughter of Babylon and you believe it, then you need to prayerfully say to him in prayer, okay, I believe it, so what do I do about fleeing? And then do what he says. I had one pastor say to me, I agree it's the daughter of Babylon. I agree I should flee, but I've prayed about it, and God has told me that I should stay here and minister to the sick and the dying. And I said, God bless you, sir. You may be one of those exceptions to the rule that God has led you to do it, but when God says something ten times, you have to take it pretty seriously. Roger that. 
I, I fully understand. Gentlemen, we have got about eight minutes left. I can't, can't believe how quickly this time has, has gone. Um, you, I, I just respect each and every one of you, both Joe and I do, and we are certainly looking forward to meeting you and, and, and uh, having fellowship with you at the Prophecy Forum Conference. Folks, par- theprophecyforum.com, theprophecyforum.com, or if you somehow can't remember that, just go to hagmanhagman.com, click on the icon there. Uh, a world turned upside down, decoding the dramatic new signs, hastening the Lord's return. We'll give each of you, uh, I guess, about a minute uh, uh, to uh, uh, for your final uh, closing statements, if you will. Uh, let's start with Doug Krieger. Mr. Krieger, go ahead. Well, my statement is that, it, that if you can't come to this conference, I want you to go to the Prophecy Forum and uh, see if you can stream it because there's going to be a live streaming, about uh, 15 sessions, and I think it's going to be worth it that if you can't make it here to the polar vortex, which is really not as cold as I thought it was, by the way. I hasten to add. I mean, I, I lived in Denver. This is not really that cold. <laughs> but but I would say that uh, please uh, uh, see if you can go online and uh, join us uh, at the Prophecy Forum. There's going to be almost 450 people there. And uh, we are expecting uh, God's great blessing. And, again, if you can't make it, just uh, see if you can stream it and join us at that point. Fantastic. Mr. McGriff, you're up. Uh, closing comments, sir. My closing comments are Doug's, Doug Krieger's book, two books on the two witnesses, uh, have come out, order them. <laughs> they, okay. You know, we always want to know. What are we? What are we supposed to do during the the this whole time period? What is our goal? What does God want? What are we supposed to do? And this goes a long way towards answering that question. Fantastic. But by the way, let me ask a question: Will that book be available at the conference? Uh, yes, it will. Uh, there are two volumes. Uh, it's sort of a magnum opus of Israel and the Church in the last days. The two witnesses. And uh, this didn't happen overnight. This has been a compilation of nearly 35 years of uh, of working on this theologically and eschatologically. And uh, but it deals with a lot of these very, very same issues. So, um, but the two witnesses, uh, yeah. Okay, great, uh, John Price. Let's go to you for your closing comments, sir. I think it's important for people who are thinking about uh, leaving the United States to know that there really is a big world out there. Uh, It's a little frightening uh, for people who may not have traveled very much to think about leaving, but let me describe the the best part of it. And it's not the pineapple and the coffee, even though it's pretty good. The best part of it is the spiritual opportunity. Uh, Along with nine other people here, we started a new church, an English-speaking church. It's now over 100 people. Um, We meet and have terrific fellowship. My wife handles women's ministries. Uh, I teach small group Bible study. Um, We are seeing people come to Christ on a regular basis. When we baptize, we baptize in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, That's a side side benefit there, side benefit. But (laughs) what I'm I'm trying to get at is that uh, just as God scattered his people throughout the Bible, every time you turn to almost any portion of the Bible, you'll see that he's moved his people out for a reason and a purpose. Uh, you can be part of that scattering and spreading the gospel to parts of the world that that really are more anxious to hear it than probably people are in the United States right now who seem to be a little inoculated to the gospel or even even antagonistic in some cases. So think about the fact that it's not just leaving and going into a wilderness. The wilderness may be full of people who you can help save and send to heaven. No! (laughs) Uh, so you, I got you the last love word it. there, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, l- let's go to l- let's go to I, Ray. Ray, um, yeah, Ray, your your uh, last word is um, last word being, folks. If there's anybody out there that want to talk about maybe leaving America or anything, feel free to email me. I I've I've had more people come down and visit us in Costa Rica. And you show them around and everything. I've got ex- I've got information on Belize. I've got information on Costa Rica, Panama, Nicaragua. Um, but if you've got questions, email me. 
and I'll be glad to take the time to answer them. I also have some blogs and everything. Email me. I'll, I'll send you my blogs and everything. But hook up with me on Facebook. I'm on Facebook all the time, facebook.com slash Rodigano. Um, but I, I will help people with answers. Get questions, I got answers. So contact me, and I'll be glad to help you. All right. And Mr. Woodward, you got the, you got the final slot, um, the final word. Hey, thank you. Well, I want to thank Ray and, and John for joining us. I think it's been fantastic. I think there's more discussed yeah, yeah. yet to uh, – yet to have, but I think we, we did a good job, I think, of getting that discussion. Um, um, I, I would mention uh, Doug Krieger and I have, uh, have also released a book um, uh, called Uncommon Sense, a Prophetic Manifesto for the Church in Babylon, and it uh, it reprises a couple of, uh, of chapters in the final Babylon, um, as well as pulling some materials that I've done from the PowerQuest book, so the real emphasis is to explain kind of why America got to where it is today and, and what we can do about it. And, again, it's called Uncommon Sense, and uh, you can find it on Amazon. You can do a search on S, as in Stephen Douglas Woodward, and find that. Uh, and then I want to thank uh, Joe and Doug Hatton for having us. It's been a fantastic evening. And yeah. Hopefully yeah. Gonna Thanks, guys. Well, I'll thank tell you, you very what. Much. It's, Good it's, job. It's been our pleasure, and we look forward to uh, supporting the Prophecy Forum, supporting each and every one of you individually and collectively. just want to say God bless, and thank you so much for your gift of time tonight. And uh, we'll be proud at the conference. Promise. God bless, gentlemen. Folks, that'll do it for us tonight. Uh, What a fantastic show. Five men of God, uh, Mr. Ray Gano, uh, Doug Woodward, Doug Krieger, Dane, or Dean uh, McGriff and John Price uh, will have all of their contact information off of HagmanHagman.com until tomorrow. We won't be here, but Sheila uh, Zelensky will be filling in for us as we travel to the conference of Dublin, Ohio. I want to wish everyone a, just a, a safe night. And, uh, and God, God bless all our guests. God bless everybody. Yeah. Have a great night. We will be live Friday. Until then, have a great evening. See you tomorrow. God bless.